Good evening, and welcome to the Township of Woolwich Committee of the Whole meeting on Tuesday, February 14th, 2023. We are now live on YouTube. I will now do a roll call of council. I, Councillor Burgess, am present and chairing this meeting. Mayor Schantz? Present. Councillor Bryant? Present. Councillor Cadeau? Present. Councillor Grant? Present. And Councillor Schwinn? Present. Thank you. We need to move a recommendation to reconvene an open session. Can I have a mover? Councillor Grant. And seconded by Councillor Cadeau. Councillor reconvenes an open session. Carried. We will now proceed to our land acknowledgement. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge the land on which we live has been here from time immemorial and that indigenous people have lived here from time immemorial. I thank the Attawandaran, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee people who have lived here and cared for this land and who continue to share and steward this land with us. May we together learn to care for each other, our flora and fauna and the land that sustains us. The next order of business is our disclosure of pecuniary interest. Do any councilor members have any declarations of pecuniary interest? I see no declarations of pecuniary interest and there are no items to come forward from closed session, no public meetings and no presentations. Moving on to delegations. Before we hear from delegates this evening, please be advised of the following instructions. Delegates, you have a maximum of seven minutes to speak unless council or the clerk has set a different time. There will be a timer on the screen and you will hear a warning when you have one minute and when your time is up. Once you have finished, please wait for questions of clarification from council. When there are no more questions for you, Please turn off your video or return to your seat. You are welcome to stay for the rest of the discussion and or meeting if you would like to. You're also welcome to leave quietly whenever you wish. Council, discussion and debate will start when all questions of clarification have finished. Our first delegate is Barbara Schumacher regarding Transform Waterloo Region strategies. Welcome, Ms. Schumacher. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Councillors, and staff. I am a member of 50 by 30 WR and have lived in Woolwich since 1973. Tonight, I will focus attention on many of the 78 actions found in the Transform WR report, beginning on page 76. There are many measurable strategies Woolwich might in institute to reduce emissions and to protect its residents, homes, farms, and infrastructure from the extreme weather we have experienced and we know is coming. When catastrophe occurs, the number of deaths, properties lost, the expenses not covered by insurance, the increase in insurance rates, topsoil lost to wind, the number of days people are without heat, cooling, and closed for business are all measurable. Many of the strategies taken to prevent chaos are measurable. My presentation describes some municipalities that took action because of destruction caused by climate. Some acted proactively. The variety of climate actions accomplished by these communities is inspiring. I hope their success will encourage council to take action in 2023. In May 2019, Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, Newfoundland and Labrador, hired someone whose sole job was to find ways to reduce the town's carbon footprint and mitigate the effects of climate change. In January 2023, Stratford PEI's Environmental Sustainability Coordinator received funding from the Canadian Federation of Municipalities to switch heating to more efficient sources and paid for upgrades. The Northern Alberta Development Council prepared a report to guide Peace River's plans for sustainable transit, evaluating the economic, social, and environmental outcomes. Smaller centers are increasingly realizing that transit helps alleviate 
many pressing problems, including wealth inequality, climate change, and mobility and loneliness for seniors. Transit also attracts business and is an important factor in retaining residents. Examples of expanding bus routes are found in Tilsonburg and Lincoln. Since 2015, the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund has offered money for transit-related projects in such places as Bracebridge, Fort Erie, Midland, Niagara-on-the-Lake, and Prince Edward County. By preserving our farmland, the region of Waterloo ensures the region has a thriving local food system built on local farming and food processing that feeds much of our community. The next series of municipalities are highlighted in Cities Adapt, a report of the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Welland updated intensity, duration, and frequency rainfall curves from 1963 to help deal with the future climate. Boucherville, Quebec planned for development over farmland and forests that previously absorbed rainwater by requiring retention ponds to filter runoff and ensure the capacity of the nearby river was not overwhelmed. Cities adapting to extreme heat include Oxford County. Due to climate change, southwestern Ontario is expected to experience a doubling of days over 30 degrees Celsius by 2050. In 2012, Oxford County Public Health and Emergency Services committed to develop a heat alert and response system. On extremely hot days, urban areas may be warmer than rural because of the heat island effect, but there are still significant risks in small communities. Melita, Manitoba found implementing a heat alert and response system in rural regions is challenging identifying vulnerable populations and cooling options, issuing timely alerts when the local newspaper is printed weekly. Smaller communities tend to rely instead on social networks to care for everyone. Some cities adapting to extreme weather invest in flood defense. Flooding is a feature of our region. New Hamburg has a history of flooding because much of the town is built on the floodplain of the Nith River. The town endured notable floods in 1948, 54, 75, 2008, 2018, and 2021. The Conservation Authority estimates total financial damages in the town at more than 900,000 for a five-year flood, 8 million for a 100-year level flood, and 37 million for a regional level flood. Floods are the most frequent natural hazard in Canada and flood mitigation infrastructure will reduce risk. In response to flooding, the village of Perth and over New Brunswick undertook the removal of structures at risk and dedicated the resulting open land for public use. Dufferin County prepares for the risk of wind damage by building stronger homes. Southwestern Ontario and the Southern Prairies are at greatest risk of tornadoes. Extreme wind over peaked roofs exerts an upward lift, exposing occupants to collapsing walls and falling debris. The Ontario Building Code does not presently require hurricane ties, which are inexpensive strips of metal that bind the roof rafters to the top of a wall and can sustain wind speeds of up to 217 kilometers per hour. With the investment by Dufferin County and the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction, the cost to contractors for hurricane ties was offset, thus protecting homeowners. As Canadian municipalities plan for development or rehabilitation of infrastructure, Considerations for both future risks and needs are essential to ensure long-term performance and the highest possible return on investment. I hope you will investigate these examples further and find climate solutions which will fit Woolwich during 2023. Climate action is possible. 
municipalities are doing it and we can do it too. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schumacher. That was perfect timing. Um, Council, do you have any questions for the delegate, Mayor Schantz? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So this might be a tough one for you, but um, we, we've got about $190,000 that goes into the uh, green fund every year. What would be your priority for those funds? If you could, if you could direct us to, to, um, to do the most good with that fund, how would you do that? What would you recommend? Well, I, I would like to see the hiring of a sustainability climate action coordinator. I know um, Councillor Schwint, uh, who happens to be my ward councillor, um, last time I was here, uh, was hoping that um, volunteers in the community that are um, passionate about these things would give assistance to the council, and certainly we will. That's what I'm trying to do by coming today. But, you know, I'm just scratching the surface on these things. And I, I have no capacity to be able to write um, proposals for grants or for funding that we could have to do some of the projects. And I see evidence that small places are doing this when they have um, a person who's assigned to those projects. Um, when I also see uh, communities looking at the um, development of um, the heat response that I was talking to you about, small communities, it's, it's really um, a matter of educating and organizing the community in cooperative ways to look after one another. And um, I, I mean, volunteers can help with that, but it really needs to be spearheaded by um, a person who has that job. And that's what I'd like to see. Thank you. Councilor Grant. Thank you through you, uh, Chair. This is maybe more of a general question. I'm just wondering what is allowed in the township when it comes to green initiatives. So solar panel, I know we've discussed geothermal, that there are areas that they can't use. Is wind also something that's in the bylaw that we can, I'm not really sure who I'm directing this to, but I'm looking at David as expected. Go ahead, Mr. Brenneman. Yeah, so I, I I don't think I can directly say what what is or isn't allowed. Um, however, uh, since you ended with your comment about wind, um, it's one of the things I asked early on here in, in my tenure here with Woolwich, um, with um, some members of the farming community. How come we don't see uh, more wind turbines? And basically, the short answer was because we don't have. Um, the winds that that they do in other parts of the province. So the investment is not uh, that the investment is not there. Um, and I think, as we've discussed before, um, my only understanding on the uniqueness around um, some of those comments that were shared around geothermal had more to do with us being reliant on groundwater and the region wanting to certainly protect um, you know any potential sources of of source water uh, protection. From all that, but you know, if council needs more information, we can certainly do some homework. Yeah, thank you. I would, I would personally, I just really appreciate that because I, I think it's something that maybe we maybe need to look into a bit more, um, especially when it comes to wind. I've had some residents say that they don't think they're allowed to have smaller wind turbines on their property. That there may be a bylaw that's preventing that. So I think there's a lack of clarification sure. that would be maybe helpful to bring forward. Very good. Any other questions from council? All right, seeing none, thank you, Mrs. Schumacher, for your delegation to council. A reminder, you can stay for the rest of the council meeting if you'd like, or you can leave whenever you wish. Uh, next up, we have the Director of Corporate Services, Jeff Smith, to provide council with an overview of his report for the Multicultural Festival Grant. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you. Um, just for some background, uh, Ms. Cooper and I had some uh, discussions last year 
uh, about an anti-racism workshop series that she wanted to run. And we were able to provide her for a, a small grant uh, under, the, uh, under the threshold that council approves um, last year. We've connected again uh, earlier this year when she shared the thought of um, her HOPE uh, multicultural festival. And I think Ms. Cooper can explain her idea much, much better than I can. Um, but what I would like to say is I would strongly encourage council to consider grassroots community-led initiatives uh, like the one uh, Ms. Cooper is bringing to you. Um, and if you do want to support uh, her initiative after you hear from her tonight, I just wanted to, uh, you know, my report goes over two issues that you, you'll need to consider. So the first is budget. Um, we don't have uh, funding in our 2023, uh, in the proposed 23 budget um, for grants like this. Um, however, council did actually, uh, I think one or two members of council did bring up the idea of potentially adding uh, $6,000 into the 2023 budget for equity, diversity, and inclusion, or EDI events and activities that I think this would be a perfect candidate for. The other piece is fairly minor, uh, just that the grants policy uh, limits applicants from receiving grant uh, funding more than once. And I think the, uh, uh, as I've explained in the report, I think the, the nature of Ms. Uh, Ms. Cooper's ideas are, are varied enough uh, that she could receive more than uh, one grant from the township for her ideas. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions for council and uh, I won't steal uh, Ms. Cooper's thunder when she uh, presents her wonderful idea. Any questions, council, for Director Smith? All right, seeing none, um, thank you, Director Smith. Uh, we'll now go on to our delegate, Abby Cooper, from the HOPE organization. Welcome, Abby, you can go ahead when you're ready. Uh, so good evening, Mayor Sean's chair, chair um, council staff, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present to you tonight. I'm here to request funding to support, um, funding support for the Township of Village um, for the Multicultural Festival of Myra, or MFE. So um, I'm not sure do you, if you have the presentation um, running there. So just, um, just wanna make sure that you have reference to that. Okay, uh, so first of all, why Elmira? Elmira is growing. According to the 2016 census, the rural townships are 12.5% of the Waterloo region population, and they're growing at a faster rate than the cities and at a higher growth rate than the province and country. New homes are being built around Elmira in the south end as well as on the north end, uh, plans for the north end. Um, as Elmira continues to grow, so does its diversity. The region continues to experience an increase in immigration. According to the 2016 census again, there were approximately 2,625 immigrants in the region of Waterloo, and of that amount, they make up 10.7% of the total population of Woolwich. Celebrating culture in Elmira would be a great way in welcoming, retaining, and integrating newcomers. Upon looking at some data provided by the 2019 Waterloo Region Community Wellbeing Survey and the focus groups conducted by community leaders in Waterloo Region's townships, it was found that people are more likely to participate in local events that support community and inclusivity. And there is a need for more variety in cultural programming and low cost activities. Other rural towns have jumped on this type of community event. Goderidge and Listowel have had, held annual multicultural festivals and Listowel is actually on its 11th year. So it'll be great once we start rolling on this event. Next slide, please. Uh, for music to education, there's so much beauty and excitement that each country and culture brings to our community. To that end, the activities during MFE will highlight these cultures to, um, by including performances, food, art, and culture. Depending on funding, I've tentatively booked um, diverse performers that will open our community to traditional dances from South Indian, China, Turkey, Ukraine, Spain, and Africa. And I'll also plan on adding a Native Indian performance there as well. For food, uh, sorry, for kids, there'll be a reading corner to give them the opportunity to learn more about different cultures. And there'll also be like a craft area and a magic show and face painting. 
For food, I plan on bringing in food trucks that specialize in Mexican, Indian, Jamaican food, which will give us a good range of diverse flavors, and also maybe an ice cream truck in there for kids to enjoy. I'll also reach out to artists who might be interested in displaying and selling some of their diverse art pieces. During the week of the festival, people will get a chance to attend workshops on different cultures so that people can get a deeper understanding of their history and traditions. And at the festival, there'll be booths um, available from various organizations within Woolwich and surrounding areas for counseling, gender diversity, health and wellness services. This is a very important piece to the event that'll provide those experiencing challenges due to race, sex or physical abilities with accesses to different resources available to us in town. And it can also aid in the basic physical well-being of people in need of belonging to the community. Performers will be providing mini dance workshops also to get people engaged in moving. Volunteers um, will also be engaging with the community by handing out door prizes, uh, door prize tickets, sorry. Uh, so to tie in with the education aspect of the event, there'll be workshops as well as the, oh, oh, sorry. Next, next slide, yes. <laughs> Um, it's important that this inaugural festival includes care, um, it, key areas that will make it a success. So I've included costs associated with the use of Gibson Park and marketing at the event. Um, food trucks and vendors will be charged at $25 each to help offset some of the minor expenses like supplies and signage costs. Local organizations and retail businesses have been contacted for the opportunity to sponsor the event like McDonald's, Village Community Health Center and MCC. Grant applications will also be submitted for United Way, Region of Waterloo Upstream Fund, um, and the Community Support Multiculturalism and Anti-Racism Initiatives Program through the Government of Ontario. The township will be effectively promoted through various marketing channels, including a press release, um, the main event website that I'll be developing, promotional materials, social media channels, and on the main banner of the festival. The township will also be acknowledged on stage at the start of the festival as well. Next slide. MFU will present many opportunities to the township, including business development and tourism and opportunities for growth. The event will draw in a large number of local residents, as well as visitors from outside of town, and as a result, can benefit local businesses that can hold promotions or sales and can gain awareness of our diverse and inclusive friendly town from those looking to re relocate. If MFE becomes a success, we can make this an annual event where we can introduce more diverse cultural performances, which can then lead to building a larger following and then lead to an increased number of visitors each year. The event will also help people to become more open and understanding toward different races, traditions and customs, which I feel will help us build a stronger community. Next slide. Community capacity building involves enhancing, enhancing the students' abilities, resources, and commitment of communities and community members to care for each other, nurture unique talents and leadership, and act on challenges and opportunities. One of the major benefits is, this, is that individuals within our community can gain a sense of belonging, purpose, and dignity. Um, so MFE will be able to achieve this. Um, through educating, um, promoting and engaging, supporting community members, and building an understanding of the disparities and challenges faced by different racial, racialized communities. My hope for MFE is for people to know that everyone's voice can be heard. The more exposure our community has of different racial groups, the more likely people will grow to become more open and understanding to them. The township's contribution to MFE will speak volumes to the community, showing its support and awareness and the importance of celebrating the many cultures that exist around us. The event will bring joy, excitement, liveliness to Elmira and help bring about positive change and inclusive <laughs> within the township. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Council, do you have any questions for Ms. Cooper? Mayor Shantz? Thanks for the presentation, Abby. Do you have, um, th this seems quite ambitious. Are you working alone? Do you have a committee? Are you looking for additional volunteers? Yes. So I have a committee that I've built and it's continued to grow. Um, uh, there'll be, 
I have 20 at the moment and I'm hoping for more. So if anyone would like to help volunteer for the event, I strongly recommend that you <laughs> get in touch with me. And um, it would be great to have um, as many volunteers as possible, especially for during the event, we'll need all hands on deck. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any other questions from council? All right, seeing none. If there are no further questions or comments, I'd like to thank Ms. Cooper for her delegation to council. You can stay on for the rest of the council meeting if you'd like, or you can sign off at any time. Thank you. There is a recommendation in this report. Is there anyone who would like to move the recommendation? All right, moved by Councillor Grant and seconded by Councillor Cadeau. Any further discussion? Councillor Schwint? So I support the recommendation in terms of the $3,000 grant for HOPE. I do wonder why we'd include the $6,000 line item in this motion, not have it part of the budget conversation. Director Smith? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Uh, this was something that came up um, you know, uh, I guess fairly well on into the budget uh, deliberation process. Um, it's something that um, I actually think council had had a great idea. Um, some members of council brought uh, brought this idea forwards. Um, so I think um, when I heard that Ms. Cooper was interested in holding a multicultural festival that kind of dove dovetailed quite nicely into this um, idea that uh, that some members of council had for grant, I thought, you know, this might not be the only one. Um, so I, I kind of went back to that six thousand dollars that council had had started discussing. Um, I, I definitely think um, you know the three thousand dollars for uh, the Hope Multicultural Festival uh, would be a great start uh, for the for the community. And then there could be additional initiatives that we don't know about yet that uh, that would be coming forward uh, throughout the rest of the year. Um, but ultimately, I leave it up to council um, council discretion how much they wish to include in the budget. Did I follow up on that, Councillor Schwint? No, because I, I support it. I just, we were being very, very careful, I think, last month not to pass motions on the budget as separate motions. I think this does that. But also, the day I support all three items. So, nitpicking. Councillor Cadeau. Thanks through you, Chair, um, to Director Smith. This $6,000 would then encompass the monies that we've uh, put forth for pride as well as this side of it. Is that correct? Um, to you, Mr. Chair, I actually did not include those monies in this. Uh, they do have a separate line that was put right into the budget for that group. Um, if it's something that you want to, uh, to look at including those monies within the $6,000, um, I'm just going uh, calculating from memory. Uh, which is never a great thing, but I think you'd be down to uh, close to the uh, $1,200 mark for any additional events uh, that we don't even know might be coming forward, or, or I guess I should say additional events or activities, um, because I do think it needs to be left um, left fairly open. And I, I saw the treasurer nod at me, so I think I did the math fairly well in my head. Any shots? I wonder if there's concern about the six thousand dollars for the budget. If we can just um, defer that to our budget discussion, which is happening really shortly anyway, um, but leave the uh, the rest. Or uh, maybe I'll ask Mr. Patrick what would be the most efficient way to to handle this. <clears throat> so to you, Mr. Chairman, um, it. My advice, it's always best if you deal with it within the context of the budget, because that way you are discussing any of the changes. But if council so chooses they they want to pass this resolution right now, and since we're going to have the budget discussion very shortly after this, you can sort of look at it in the full context to say, if you were to add in 6,000, or if you were to recognize a part of the six would be from the uh, the pride event that's going to be happening in Amara that you know this would be the impact to the budget and then we can or council can decide at that time 
what further actions they want to take from the budget, leave it as is, or if they want to do something else, find it somewhere else. But it's totally up to council. So if we move this recommendation that number one says add $6,000 to the budget, when we get to the budget discussion, we could then take it out if we chose. Is, is that what you just said? No. <laughs> no. So, 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 okay. so you, Mr. Chairman, I think if council decides this, they would be saying, yes, they want to add it in. I think some clarification would be out of the six, would there be 3,000 that's going to go out of the six, 3,000 for this HOPE event? And out of the remaining three, would council want that as 3,000 as a whole? Or would they want to say, well, we have a, a well, which part event that's happening in Amira, so therefore then you'd want to take that out of the three. And then as uh, Clerk Smith said, you'd be left with about $1,200. And then that's kind of like the additional budget would be the three plus the 1,200. And then if council says, okay, we've added something, but I want to actually reduce the tax rate down to maybe something less, then council decide where that can come from somewhere else. Thank you. CEO Brenneman. Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to weigh in on, on this discussion because uh, what I would hate to see is because I know uh, even even Richard has had a, a practice of directing council that if you're going to deal with the 3,000 in isolation, we always like to know what the source of funding is. So it may be best if council refers both the decision on the grant and the potential EDI funding to the budget discussion, and then you can make a decision on both because making a decision on the $3,000 still doesn't direct staff what the source of funding is for that $3,000. However, I appreciate there's a motion on the floor, so we'd have to uh, get the support of the mover and seconder to um, move this just as part of the budget process. Councillor Cadeau. Thank you, Chair. Through you to that end, um... When I'm looking at this, I would envision the budget line item to be the EDI, and that would encompass things like uh, what we're discussing today, as well as uh, events like the Pride. I think that they're kind of part and parcel, um, in a sense. So to break them out doesn't make as much sense to me. Um, could we add the $6,000 to that line item, call it something else, and then we have the source of monies as well uh, for, for this uh, and the Pride event, as well as potentially some others that may come forward over the next year. That would be advice that I would suggest. Uh, interested in Council's thoughts on that. Mayor Shantz? I... I'm I'm going to move that we defer this to the budget discussion so that we can have everything in the fullness of the budget discussion because I think it's going to start to get kind of convoluted otherwise. So um, I don't know, Mr. Smith, how you want to uh, handle that procedurally, but I would make that motion if that's required. Through you, Mr. Chair, I, if you wanted to move that motion, we just look for a second and then a vote on the deferral. Um, I think you could have the discussion in the budget, and then uh, if we're deferring until after the budget discussion, we could always bring uh, the remainder of these um, of these uh, recommendations forward after the budget discussion. Go ahead. Turn on your mic, please. Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, would there be any repercussions uh, for delaying a decision on this as far as planning goes? Could we kind of project a decision forward that this is kind of uh, approved in theory uh, as we kind of await those. Yeah. Okay. Also Grant. Do you chair, I would just second Mayor Schantz's reckon. Um, All right, second. <laughs> Motion, yeah. <laughs> Councillor Grant, um, any farther discussion on delaying that? All right, all those in favor? And that's carried. All right, there is no unfinished business. And now we're on to consent items. Before we pass a motion receiving the consent agenda for approval and information, does anyone on council wish to remove any items for farther discussion? Uh, 
All right, seeing none. Is there anyone who would like to move the recommendation that the following consent items be approved and received for information? Items for approval. Item C06-2023, specially appointed officers for St. Jacob's Schoolhouse Theater. And item F04-2023, Ontario Regulation 284 backslash 09 budget exclusions 2023. And items for information, we have the memo of summary of traffic and parking bylaw amendments, the notice of intent to pass the budget. The Council of the Township of Woolwich gives public notice of its intent to discuss and adopt the final 2023 consolidated budget at the regularly scheduled Council meeting on February 21st, 2023, starting at 7 p.m. in the Council Chambers situated at 24 Church Street West in Elmira and on Zoom and live stream to the Township of Woolwich YouTube channel. Can I have a mover? Councillor Bryant and seconded by Councillor Grant. Any further discussion on those items? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that's carried. There are no items to be pulled from the information package for further discussion. And moving on to staff reports and memos, we have Fire Chief Dennis Aldos to provide council with an overview of his report on open air burns and recreational campfires. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the staff report that I'm putting forward is to bring, basically bringing our campfire regulations into our bylaw. Back in 2013, council approved um, and our open, our open air burning bylaw within the township. At that time, it uh, dealt with our more of our controlled um, rural burns. So it brought it into, um, made it a lot nicer for us and a lot, um, but it didn't do anything to do with residential campfires. So in 2017, there was a, an improved amendment that came in that made a request that you needed to have a campfire permit in order to have a recreational campfire in the township boards. So earlier last year, last year we were looking at all our fire related bylaws and we came up with um, some improvements that needed to be done to our recreational campfire um, permit. And we thought it'd be best to bring it into um, that permit into our bylaw as well. Um, so part of it comes up with was it's all based on complaints and issues that we had. So it bring, brings in, um, it makes you, so the campfires is you have to, everything has to be contained within the campfire pit is one of the major changes. Um, we've had um, past practices where it's supposed to be two feet by two feet, but it turns into four foot and more pieces over top of the fire pit. So we like to, we've made that change into our bylaw, into our permit. Um, We've also dealt with some of the things that are being burnt. Some of the complaints that have come out of a lot of our rural areas is people burning more leaves and garden waste. So it creates more of a stink and a lot more smoke in those areas. And one of the last ones is what we're looking at is we put a time frame in, which makes us in line with some of our neighbors like Kitchener, Wilmot, and North Dumfries. So that time frame for us and them is 10:59 p.m which, and then from 10, 59 PM to eight o'clock in the morning, there'll be no burning at all. That brings us in line with um, our noise bylaw as well. Um, and part of the reason for that is the complaints that we receive in a lot of our urban areas are dealing with smoke going into people's yards and then it's noise due to an event that's in their backyard. So um, we've added the time frame in there. So it gives us a little bit more so we can go um, and actually extinguish the fire if we get a complaint after that time frame. Um, so uh, through the recommendation is we're looking for council to um, approve our new bylaw and have mayor and clerk sign it. And I'm welcome to take any questions that anybody has at this time. Thank you, Chief Eldos. Council, are there any questions for him? Councilor Schmidt. Um, I guess I'm wondering if we're trying to solve problem A with problem B. So I was checking my mic with this 
by law, um, starting with timing. Um, I guess I'm wondering why we care if a person wants to fire at one in the morning. I know in rural areas for sure, people may be out. Um, noise complaints, got a lot of uh, patients for those complaints and they should be dealt with, but a fire I don't, can't fire, for example, doesn't, I think, create an issue like that. Um, so like bringing more regulation to a matter that I don't think needs regulation, I'm fundamentally always worries me. And you mentioned size two feet by two feet. That seems arbitrary in rural areas, whereas they're probably very important in urban. So I'm wondering, are we going too far with this? Um, to through count through to chair to Councillor Swit, um, the sizes and stuff and the locations of it it goes like I said it goes back to um, 2017 when we originally passed the the permit process. Um, the size of two foot by two foot is your typical um, campfire bowl that you buy in a in a in a hardware store. Um, so that's kind of what. The recommendation was back then is just keep it to a, a certain size um, for your um, noise and stuff like um, there's a lot of places where you're right people are sitting outside and nobody really um, complains about them but we do get the complaints where we get them and um the unfortunate part is some of it is dealing with a complaint about the smoke and that's in our bylaw for even for our big large open burns that if people complaining about smoke in their house and they're bothering them that we can put it out so it's just giving it more of a timeline to make it so that instead of having it open ended if somebody calling us at nine o'clock at night or seven o'clock in the evening at least at least it gives people some time to enjoy their campfire at a set point i mean we're not going to be out driving the neighborhood trying to Put out fires it's just if we get a complaint that's what it's based on i follow up mr chair i'm only i'm sort of understanding you won't be out chasing it but why have in the law if that's not the intent and the other part that really got my attention was to get the original permit it's saying the fire chief or someone will go out and inspect it please tell me that's not the case um you can't chair. afford that through chair, um, that's what we've been doing all the way along because we want to make sure that um, the fire pits and stuff are in the location where they need to be. Um, you don't want them right up against the fence because we've had issues with that. So it's more just making sure where the placement of it is. Mm -hmm. And we go out and look at, like, especially in any, any campfire permit we get, we go out and look at just to make sure that it's perfectly fine. Councillor Cado. Thank you, Chair. Through you um, to the Chief, do you have any statistics on how many um, applications you would deny based on the the review that you would do? Um, we can find you out some information on that, but um, most of them is based on the size of it. It's our newer areas of subdivisions, like the the new um, townhouses and stuff that are in Breslau and Amaya because the yards aren't wide enough to keep us away from that. And they get turned down all the time. Our recommendation for them, if they wish to have that type of thing, is to go for natural gas or propane. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bryant. Thank you, through you to the chief. Do we know how many complaints we're getting every year and are they mostly urban complaints or are they coming from uh, rural areas as well? Uh, through chair to Councillor Bryant. Um, we can look up to see exactly how many, but they are urban and depending on your definition of rural, but a lot of our smaller communities, we're seeing more uptake in um, our more rural village settings like uh, Mary Hill as an example, where they're bigger yards, we're still getting our complaints in the last couple of years have been going up in that area. Conestoga is the same thing. Councillor Schwint. Um, based on what you're Telling me, I understand the concerns of where the fire pits should be, but if it's a complaint-based system, would it make more sense to be a lot more cost-effective to have this bylaw um, set the standards 
as to where a fire pit could be. And you presume to be able to have a fire if it meets those standards. And then if it doesn't, when there's a complaint, you've got the power to deal with it as opposed to an expensive site visit by firefighters, which are in short supply in this township we've been hearing. Um, through Chair to Councilor Swint, um, it is a, an option, uh, it's just that um, we've been finding, especially in a lot of our urban areas, is that people aren't um, doing that. They're just putting them, uh, they're just having fires. We've had one person who had one in his driveway. Like it's just, um, we've always gone out and since this permit is done and inspected them, just it's a one-time thing. It's done once just to make sure it's compliant and that's all we do. Councilor Grant. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, I would imagine those site visits are also an opportunity to educate about fire safety to residents, but I was wondering if there is liability in us not inspecting um, a fire, like a, a fire pit, if we were not to proceed with those site visits, if there would be some sort of liability on the behalf of the township. Um, through chair to Councillor Brian, it's an interesting, I mean, the permit process we've had in place for like a number of years, um, the whole thought process and behind it is probably just like you're saying, is to try and reduce our liability so that it keeps neighbors fences in place and make sure we don't burn down, um, sheds and stuff like that. Um, there probably is a huge liability in it. I'm not specifically sure what it is. Um, open air burning is regulated within the entire fire code. So it's something that we can um, deny at any given time. So it's more of a, um, a privilege, not a right to be able to have one. So that's kind of, I mean, there is a bit of liability against it, so. If I... Councilor Schwinn. On the liability side, personally, I'd be more, I'm more concerned about our liability after the fire visit happens than if one hadn't happened. Because once we're out there and approve it, we've approved it. Versus if we're not there, we can, and if it doesn't meet specs after the fact, we can say, hey, you didn't meet our rec not recommendations, our requirements in the code. Therefore, you're liable. But once we're there, we're assuming something. Um, through chair to council, Swint, part of it is the, by approving it, it actually allows us better uh, enforcement of it. So um, because we've been there, they looked at it. If it's if we get a call back and it's not how it's set up it's supposed to be, <clears throat> the the bones behind the bylaw gives us a better opportunity to charge and fine for that type of thing. Any last questions? Uh, Councillor Cadeau and then Mayor Shantz. Thank you, Chair, through you. Ultimately, I see this as a proactive uh, approach to dealing um, with some of the dangers that are associated with this. I am a little concerned, um, you know, with what uh, Councillor Schwint is saying, just around the cost that's associated with some of these inspections, and perhaps we look at having a service fee attached to this, if it's something that we're going to be uh, placing our focus on with a concerted effort, um, and spending staff resources uh, to manage, maybe we should try to recoup some of those costs. So I'd be interested in council's thoughts on that if we are gonna proceed with this. Any comments on Councillor Gittos? <laughs> Go ahead, Councillor Gittos. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, to the rest of council, I would wonder if there's a fee for, for getting the permit, would that not be a part of the cost? of those, like the, the fee you pay for a permit would be paying partially for the site inspection. Um, through chair to Councillor Grant, um, currently the permits have been free of charge. It's more of an awareness of getting the people to have the permit, making sure that they're safe and that we're not in, it's more on public safety than it was on trying to cost recovery. 
um, we can look at doing that type of a thing. It'd be something that would have to, um, we'll check with Mr. Petrick, but I'm pretty sure it'd have to go through our fees and charges to make that happen, which is something we can look at doing if council wishes for us to put a, a dollar value on a permit. Uh, Mayor Shantz. Thank you. I, I'm not real anxious to um, start charging everybody for backyard campfires, but I am wondering if someone applies for a permit in 2020 um, and, and they've got their site inspected and you've said it's okay, do they have to apply every year? And do you just, do you keep a record of the property? Um, through chair to Mayor Schantz. Um, it's a one-time permit as long as the people own that property. Um, they are given a copy of the permit so they know the rules, the dates and stuff that when we were there. Plus we retain a copy, um, a paper copy plus an electronic copy within our system. So if we get called there for something, we can quickly reference that they have it. And um, so we do know where they are. Council Bryant. Thank you. I am concerned that if we start charging people to do this, that people aren't going to get permits, period. They'll just start back it. And then we're going to have a bigger problem on our hands. So I'm a little concerned with charging people for an inspection that could potentially save lives. <laughs> just my thoughts. Thank you. Any other Councillor Schwint? Following up on Councillor Bryant, is it an expect? that will save lives or is it something we could just have in regulation here are the requirements that you're expected to meet in order to have a campfire we say you're supposed to look after your animals under these guidelines we don't go out and inspect it i think we're creating a problem when there maybe isn't one ceo brenneman It's it's an interesting um, uh, point Councillor Schwint makes, um, but it also makes me think that um, something I've looked at, you know, throughout my career, which is is that often we have legislation or regulations because in the past the minority have ruined it for the majority, and what I mean by that is you're always dealing with these public health and safety concerns. And so uh, I, I certainly appreciate Councillor Schwent, um, you know, what you've noted, but what, what makes me think though, and I don't know whether you would agree uh, as yourself as a member or, or a council, but when you were talking about that, I thought of the fact that, well, in many ways though, um, you know, we could have um, builders that say, well, we know what the building code is. We don't need your building inspectors to come and inspect it um, because, we have to we have to build to the code, but we do go out and inspect it. Um, and yes, we do charge for that. <laughs> um, but we do go out and inspect that um, because we want to make sure from a public safety perspective that the home is built to the code standards. So uh, I only raise it because it's an interesting discussion that council has, which is, you know, do you set the boundaries, as Councillor Schwint has noted, and then, you know, just say, okay, um, you have to meet that and we're only going to respond if there's an issue. Um, and comparing that to, we don't do that on the building inspection side, you know, and are there valid reasons to compare the two? So anyways, just something to, uh, for council to consider as you're deliberating, you know, where you want to go with this. Thank you, Mr. Brenneman. Uh, Councillor Cadeau. Thank you, Chair. Through you, just a comment, and I recognize, you know, what has been said about not wanting to charge people for backyard campfires, but we are. We're charging people. It's just subsidizing the people that have these campfires in their backyards at the expense of all of the ratepayers, right? So we are charging for this. Uh, so just kind of point of clarification. Any other questions from Council for the Chief? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Chief Eldos. Um, there is a recommendation in the report. Is there anyone who would like to move this recommendation? Okay. 
Councillor Grant. Would anyone like to second it? Is there any farther information or from staff to help with the report? Councillor Schmidt. Instead of passing this tonight, I'm wondering if staff could come back with a couple of different options. One based on the current proposal put out and one based on a regulatory proposal without inspection and at the same time provide some data how many permits are we issuing? What the time commitment is and dollar cost is each year the township incurs so we can make a more educated decision. Mayor Shantz. Can I just ask a question of, of Chief? How many do we have um, on file right now? Do you, do you know that number or approximately? Um, through Chair to Mayor Shantz. Um, since this program started, we're probably well over 1,200 permits within the township of Wolf. Any other direction or thoughts on this we can provide for staff, Councillor Comprent? Thank you. Through you, um, could you give us numbers on how many complaints we're getting per year and where those complaints are coming from, whether they're rural or whether they're urban, just to give us some better insight as to where the issues lie? Please. Any farther information? Craig Smith, that's good, clear. All right, so we'll leave it at that for now and staff can come back with more information there. All right, moving on to budget. Uh, we have Director of Financial Services, uh, Richard Petherick here to provide council with an overview of his report. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So for the tour discussions at budget uh, back in January, as well as the uh, last discussion we had at the council meeting of January the 30th, uh, staff are bringing back the uh, final budget, uh, at least the changes to the budget that we heard at these meetings. This has resulted in an overall tax increase of 8.58%, uh, and that uh, can be broken down into 0 0.8, 7.08% uh, yeah, uh, for the base and 1.5% for the infrastructure levy. Uh, so I'm not gonna go over the changes uh, that have been made. They're contained within the report. Uh, I know council uh, will want to discuss further things with the budget, in particular, the um, delegation we had tonight from uh, Abby Cooper. Uh, I think one of the things uh, from an advice perspective that I would have as we go through the budget, maybe if council has certain things that, uh, you know, they want to vote on separately, I would encourage you maybe you want to bring that vote on that separately, because I think my my thought is, is that council may be in general okay with most of the budget, but there are a couple of things that they may not. So I think if you vote on that separately, you've kind of had your say, you've dealt with that issue. And then when it comes to the final budget, you can say, yeah, I'm okay uh, with the budget as is because I made my comments and my direction on uh, the things that have been brought forward before. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, hand it back to you and let you lead the discussion through, uh, through budget. Thank you, Mr. Petherick. I guess council, is there any questions or items you'd like to bring forward? Councillor Bryant. Thank you. Um, in this report, can we pull number one, which is the budget out of that report and deal with that specifically, the uh, number one in that list? Yes. And do you want me to start that off now? <laughs> okay. Go ahead. I'll start it off. Um, I've had a number of emails over the last few days and I forwarded them off to council, a lot of them. They've seen a lot of the issues people have been raising with me. Um, and out of those discussions, there's been a few items that I wanna bring up and ask that we discuss again. One of them is we uh, look at the Peel Street Bridge and defer it for one year to give everybody a chance to bring themselves up to speed and figure out what the issues are with that bridge. Cause I know that's been a big bone of contention for this council. Another one is the staffing requests. Can we defer the staffing requests for one year and sit where we are now? 
um, the climate change position, it should be a regional position with collaboration with the municipalities. That's the feedback I've been getting, and that's my thoughts as well. I think because most of the municipalities I don't think are large enough to support a climate change position. I think it's one that if we work together with, within the whole region, it will be more cost efficient. Um, can we remove 22 Mockingbird from the budget? That would save us $200,000. And the other one is removing the charging station in St. Jacobs. I don't feel we have sufficient information on that. And we're not in the business of running that type of a, a item, I guess, to raise money. It just doesn't make sense to me. So those are the issues I have that I see in the budget. So I'm going to put them out on the floor and see where the rest of council wants to go. Thank you, Councillor Bryant. Uh, Mayor Shantz. Thank you. Just a um, point of clarification. I didn't get all of your items there, but that's okay. Um, my question was around the climate position because I don't believe that's part of the budget. Uh, um, did we not add that? Did we not adding point eight? No, Sorry. We asked for a report to come back. Okay. Yeah, to so determine that's correct. Yeah, it's to be report, uh, reported back to council. Okay, my misunderstanding, but that's my thoughts. Thank you. Any other comments from council or should we go ahead one by one on those items? Go ahead, Councilor Schmidt. So listening to the Councilor Bryant's list, um, I'm liking it on balance. One question I have is that climate change, which will be a report coming back. Do we want that to be a regional position or is that something we should investigate with the other townships sharing it and leave the region out? Just your thoughts. Good. My thoughts was it should be a regionally led initiative and then the collaboration would happen with all the municipalities and the townships because they are the, I'm gonna say the head umbrella of this whole region. So they should be the ones leading the charge and then all of us collaborating together on that. It would be more cost efficient. Mayor Johns. Yeah, right now, <clears throat> excuse me, the region has a number of um, environmental type positions, and I believe the cities all do as well. Mr. Brenneman, would you know that? So I think it's just the townships that don't have any kind of um, resource um, specifically for them, just for information. Would they connect with the townships and kind of coordinate with <laughs> us or? They being the green managers and stuff there in the region. I, I, I think it would be up to us to to do that um, yeah. with the other townships if yeah. that's what we wanted to do. Councilor Cadeau. Thank you, Chair. Three, I think that we would need somebody on our end for them to connect with. I think that's kind of what's missing. Um, so having this position housed within Woolwich, it ensures that their focus is on Woolwich. You know, it's not on Waterloo Region. It's not on North Dumfries or anywhere else. It's on Woolwich. And I really think that that's kind of what we're hearing from the delegates and what I'm hearing from some of the constituents as to, you know, what they envision this role to be. Mayor Shantz? I wonder if we can hold that conversation till we get the staff report unless there's some direction you want to give to staff before that report comes all right thank you any other comments or questions before we go through the list councillor schwint um i know councillor bryant went through that was fairly quickly i'm presuming mr pethrick wrote it down <laughs> Could you give us a ballpark on what that would do to the levy for this year? Ballpark. <laughs> um, so I can say right now, I will talk at least on the 22 Mockingbird. That will do nothing to the levy because it is uh, funded from reserve funds. Uh, I would say that the, so I'm just looking it up, uh, from the two positions, uh, one from the fires is costing an additional uh, or potentially could cost an additional seventy-eight thousand to the uh, to the levy. So that would be a savings if you were to take that out. Uh, the reminder to that uh, is that we have a current part-time position. So that part-time position, I would hopefully would go back in, and we would just be removing the full-time position. So it's kind of going back to where things were. Um, from the development services, so that senior uh, planner that was uh, putting an additional 92,000, almost 92,500 uh, into the budget. So between the two, you're probably 
you know, still over maybe a percent and a third. I mean, that would be my best guess because you're, you're at uh, what 1.6 and I think 1% is about 126,000. Three and one and a half. Just to clarify I thought Councillor Bryant was talking about three positions. So the third position would be within the uh, engineering. Uh, so that's the capital side of things uh, that may not have a direct uh, levy impact, depending on uh, the projects that this person would be looking for. That would probably be a savings to the reserve funds, more than likely. And that would not be a levy to you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. That would not be a levy. That would uh, be coming from a grant as well as the uh, Climate Action Green Infrastructure Reserve Fund. Sorry, and just to clarify those numbers you quoted, that's salary costs. That would include benefits, overhead, I'm going to call it. Yeah, Correct. yeah. So that that would include all the uh, st benefits and, st and statutory deductions. It would. Yeah, okay. yeah. So that would be the ninety two from the planning side, and I think it was seventy six, seventy eight from the uh, fire side. Those are the, the added expenses to the uh, to those two positions in the uh, twenty twenty three budget. Any chance? Taking out the senior planner, I think was going to likely incur some costs back to us. Um, did you include that? To you, Mr. Chairman? No, uh, because that's an unknown for us. We, I think, uh, uh, Ms. Freeze, you know, sent uh, some additional information to council saying that, you know, this would likely be, and I'm sorry, I don't have that at the top of my head, but this would likely be the uh, potential refunds we would have to to make based on the changes that occurred uh, through Bill 109 and 23 uh, from what we'd have to get back to developers by not meeting time timelines by not having that staff member. I just don't so, remember what the number was. But typically that would be included in her budget as a cost then. I think right now with the position, the assumption is that there would it's be no, no refunds. But yeah. if we remove that position, uh, presumably You're, those costs would then be included in her budget. Yeah, uh, they should be. Uh, yeah, okay. you, I would say you'd want to do that. But, um, you know, that would be something I would need probably a little more assistance with planning staff or development services staff on sort of finalizing what that number would be, because they would be forecasting out what applications would be coming forward yeah. to then in turn say, yeah, no, this is the type a, of, a, yeah, this is the type of what we'd yeah, be yeah. looking at. Yeah. CEO Brennan. Yeah, and, and just to help out with this conversation, I think the other thing um, uh, Director Freeze noted was it wasn't just the impact in terms of the potential for refunds. Um, there was also a number of projects that would have to be deferred or delayed. And so, um, you know, uh, certainly that was outlined in, I think, the very last budget session, uh, session where we went through the various um, situations. The same with... Um, if you looked at the engineering uh, project supervisor, even though it doesn't have necessarily a, uh, a significant or any levy impact, um, Mr. Uh, Director Poupe would have to speak to um, the fact that there was a number of projects that would have to be eliminated from the work program. I think it totaled about $4 million uh, in infrastructure projects, but he could speak to that as well. So those are just things I wanted to raise that were brought up in the one budget session that certainly there would be a cost savings, uh, you know, if council was looking to um, reduce the, the tax rate impact, um, but staff outlined at that session what the implications would be of that decision. Any further thoughts from council? All right, do we wanna jump right into just one of the topics, for example, 22 Mockingbird. Where does council stand on this? Does anyone else want to remove that from the budget, Councillor Cadeau? To you, Chair, I mean, if it's not going to impact the levy, what's the, I don't know if, we, if there's a real purpose in removing it. It needs to get done. Like That's why it's on that list. Um, if we're not reducing the taxes as a result, I think that it should stay. Councillor Grant? 
Thank you through, uh, through you, Chair, to this council. I would agree with Councilor Cadeau. If it's not affecting the bottom line, then I don't see much point in scratching it. Councilor Schmidt? It does affect the bottom line in that it's money being spent. It's just a different pocket it's coming out of. Um, at the same time, I do admit it's probably going to have to happen at some point. So whether we do it this year, next year, the year after, the taxpayer has to pay for it. But I am wondering if we haven't got a firm plan for what to do with that piece of land immediately, why make it happen immediately? It is reserves we would maintain for another year, less debentures, that type of thing. Uh, would the director of rec like to comment at all on that? Yeah, through you, Chair, to Councillor Schwent. So the plans at this point in time are for, for 2023 are to demolish the existing building and then convert it to uh, parking and uh, additional green space. So that's the plan um, for 2023. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, uh, I shouldn't, uh, it may roll over into 2024 possibly. But if it was removed from the uh, capital program for this year, I think we would need to uh, budget for some additional operating expenses there as we will be taking on the building in 2023 from the region. So. Councillor Grant. Um, through you, Chair, to the rest of the Council, I know also with that building, there's been a number of break-ins as well as vandalism and youth on the roof. So there is concerns from a safety standpoint of letting that building just stand empty. And yeah, hearing that there is a plan to make that green space and a parking lot, okay, we've got a plan for it, so why defer it? That does make more sense to me now. I forgot what the plan was. Um, well, we have the director online. I should have asked another question, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd asked earlier about user fees privately, wondering if you could give us an update on what our commitments are as far as user pay rates at the arenas for the next one, two, three years with our significant user groups. If we're asking taxpayers to eat a significant chunk of increase this year, um, are we spreading it proportionately among other people we work with. Don't worry, Councillor Schwenk, just trying to gather some clarification here, just looking for kind of an overview on the approved uh, 2023 fees and charges in REC, and then also kind of what the next uh, three years look like as well. Yeah, okay, just give me one second here. So, uh, Mr. Patrick reminded me that this came before the existing council on Halloween um, and the highlights for REC were uh, cemeteries. We had a 25% increase in interments and this is strictly a cost recovery as our contractor that we use uh, um, for interments raised their prices by that same amount. And then in recreation, in consultation with, uh, with other uh, local municipalities, we do reach out to all of our surrounding municipalities throughout the region each year uh, prior to fees and charges, as well as through SWARFA, which is our, our Southwestern Ontario Rec Facilities kind of group, all the municipalities uh, in Southwestern Ontario. And we, um, Council approved a between 2 and 2.5% 2 increase in fees and charges for 2023 for most rec a related uh, facility rental fees. And also uh, council approved in principle, um, a four year ice rental increase of 8%. However, having said that, um, obviously it's, if it's council's wishes to, to amend that as we go into 2024, that is, that will be up to the council to provide staff with direction. And the last one was our tenant facility. So we have a uh, tenant uh, warehouse facility located uh, uh, attached to the uh, fire station in St. Jacobs. Um, so we had uh, an advisory uh, consultant, evaluation and advisory consultant provide us uh, comparable rates throughout uh, Waterloo region based on the space, that sort of thing. And we increased the uh, 
the fees for them 12% uh, uh, over a three year lease term. Yeah, so that's, those are the highlights um, that were approved by council in 2023. Um, the major one was, uh, I guess, just for our, our minor sports organizations, it was the 8% over four years. Um, you know, we wanted to be mindful of the fact that we are coming out of the pandemic. Um, we're in a much better position now than we were probably a year ago, um, or even, you know, maybe when this was passed by council, uh, the past council. So um, that is something that if council would like us staff to take a, another look at, we're, we're happy to uh, do that at a, as, a, as a part of our fees and charges report uh, later in the year and bring that to council a recommendation for, for those fees. If I could, I'm going to be scared to go to hockey tomorrow night, but I do believe that we have an obligation to make sure that we treat all groups proportionately and minor sports, unfortunately, are one of them and we need to make sure we're fair to taxpayers and the users. So I'd like us to review it again. Questions? So my, my position on minor sports of all minor sports has been um, we should look at the fee as what the fee is and the subsidy that we provide as an investment in our youth. And so I like to think of it in those terms as opposed to um, uh, putting that subsidy uh, against the, the rental rate, if you understand what I'm saying. I understand the point. Um, my concern with it is, especially with arenas of minor hockey, is the rates are so high, we're not helping all youth equally because there's a barrier to entry. And we've got a, I want to support minor hockey, I believe it's great, and minoring it, and all those sports at the same time, we're subs, picking a subset of the population, we've got to be proportionate. Yeah, I'd ask Mr. Vanderhoff or, or Mr. Patrick, I, I believe we also subsidize um, the, the I don't know how much ball we have, but an end soccer um, as well. Is that correct? Through Mr. Chairman, I think probably Thomas would be more in tune with his own fees than I probably would be. <laughs> and and I think I may pass this along. I don't know if Ann wants to jump on. She may be able to hopefully answer this better than I can. I, I would add, though, as Ian is and uh, MacArthur is jumping on, that uh, we did run a quick analysis of uh, what a what a single percentage increase in our fees would do um, at our rec facilities, and it looks like approximately ten thousand seven hundred dollars annually for the department. So it's not a significant uh, a significant amount of revenue loss. Yeah, through you, Madam Mayor, I would add to that that um, those fees come into play in September, so we'd only realize 50% of that in one year. Um, and second point in terms of subsidizing all sports, they are um, equal in terms of what we provide for a subsidy. And I think perhaps that's something as part of the 2024 budget, you know, we could bring back an analysis that reviews what we provide and, and look at um, not necessarily the rates, but the subsidy with comparator um, municipalities for council to review next year. We'd like to give them enough notice, the minor sports groups, so they can budget accordingly. So to you know provide a significant increase in one year would be challenging. But if they knew in October we're reviewing what that subsidy is and, and looking to change that, council could consider that and give them enough notice to you know prepare budgets for the future year. Thank you. All right. Any other further questions on that? All right, thank you. And I think we had a majority on keeping the 22 Mockingbird in the budget there. Moving on to the next item, Councilor Bryant had listed, well, we got the director vendor off here is the charging stations. Is there any comments from council there? Councilor Grant. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the rest of the council. When it comes to the EV charging stations, I am I am in agreement with Councilor Bryant when it comes to, I don't think we should be in the business of providing electricity, but I also wanna weigh that against 
the fact that if we want to encourage private entities, private corporations to put those in, we may need to showcase that there is a need and a demand. And I feel that St. Jacob's being a tourist destination, it makes a particular amount of sense to offer EV stations there. So I am personally of two ways of this. I am happy to remove it, but I also see value in it as well. So typical politician flip-flop here. That's right. Thank you. Um, my suggestion would be if we want to see charging stations, we look at a, a partner in the private sector, such as home hardware, somewhere like that, that they could put them in, look after them, and then we could provide them a spot on our lot to do it, but they would not be our responsibility to maintain and look at. I think that's more what we have to look at as a partnership approach to something like that. Councillor Cadeau. Um, thank you, Chair. Through you, remind me, um, somebody, hopefully, um, a portion of these are covered through a grant though, right? So 50%, if I'm not mistaken, or are those? <laughs> through uh, Mr. Chairman, so out of the 65,000, uh, 20,000 is being proposed to be covered by a grant. So 45,000 would be coming from our reserves. Okay, thank you. And what do staff believe the payback will be on those charging stations and how confident are staff that we've got the expertise and knowledge to maintain them during their life cycle? I know I don't. Yeah, through you, Chair, to Councillor Schwinn. So in terms of maintenance, um, most of the EV charging uh, major uh, platforms we'll call come with a maintenance program as well as a software kind of program. So they do much of the heavy lifting in that area. And then in terms of payback, um, I am still uh, gathering this information from uh, from some of our neighbors in Wellesley and Wellmont and that sort of thing. And, and, and that's information that I was hoping to bring back to council um, with a report pending uh, success, if, if we're successful with the grant funding. Any other comments from council on that? Other Schwint? Well, and based on that council, we'd be making a decision at some future date whether or not to proceed once we've got all the information. So it's kind of a moot point tonight. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman. So um, to weigh into the conversation, yeah, my my understanding is, uh, I think just as Councilor Swint, um, you know, said that we do have a grant in play. Uh, Staff, I believe, are going to come back uh, to council and talk about whether we're successful with our grant because I think it's contingent on us being successful with that grant. Um, you know, but to Mr. Brennan's point, you know, the the remainder is coming from that uh, climate action reserve fund. Do we want to make a motion to put this in the budget on the condition we get the grant, or how would we like to proceed with that? Yeah, through Mr. Chairman, if um, if if Council so wishes, maybe the the motion would be something along the lines that before staff proceeds forward with it, that they just report back to Council, uh, because there is no pack, uh, impact to the levy at this stage of the game. So that maybe that's probably the best place to say, you know, because I think um, you know, as uh, Mr. Fanerhoff said, they got a grant in play. They got to see if they actually get the grant, and maybe the direction is is that. We come back as staff, as staff as, with a report and say, this is how we're going to move forward with it. Sounds like great. Through you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Council, I'd be happy with that, especially as I think it would allow Councillor Bryant's suggestion of looking for community partners. It would give us the time to do that. So I would be more than happy to support that. Thank you. And what I would like to see is a, a more detailed report as to how this is going to pay for itself, if it's going to, or how the costs are all going to come into this. I don't want to see the taxpayers on the hook for something that's going to start losing money, potentially. It's got to be a, a cost recovery or or at least equal. We can't be losing on a proposition like this. Okay. So do we have a mover and a seconder? on this. So Councillor Grant moved that and seconded by Councillor Cadeau. All, any further discussion? Sorry, could you define the motion for me, please, just so I'm clear. 
Go ahead, Mr. Petherick. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It would be that uh, before staff proceeds forward with the project, that the report back to to council with some additional information on. Um, I, I think I'm I'm here. How about we just leave it at with additional information, and then I hear, uh, not part of the resolution, but then I hear as part from a staff perspective, it's additional information on whether we have some community partners, paybacks, uh, that type of stuff. Cost benefit analysis. Cost benefit analysis. Thank you. All those in favor? That's unanimous and that's carried. All right, that looks good. Moving on to staff. Do we wanna take these individually or as a whole? All right, so I guess we'll start with the um, buyer safety or buyer trainer position. Uh, any comments there from council? Mayor Johns. I wrote down the 76,000, Mr. Petherick, for that position. Did, did I get that number right? Because that seems high. Yes, yeah, uh, to uh, Mr. Chairman. So it is uh, with this position shifting from a part time, which is what we currently have, to full time, it would uh, be an additional 78,184 to the fire budget. 78. Yeah, and that would be all encompassing salary benefits and statutory deductions. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments on that, Councillor Schwint? So, following the council meeting where we discussed this position, um, I was at a company function talking to a firefighter from Southern Norfolk or Hogman County. And in that county, all the townships have come together and they share that training officer position and they found it to be an efficient use of funds. Um, again, I guess I'd strongly encourage staff to explore that option before we make a commitment tonight to fund it solely in Woolwich. Mayor Shantz. Can I ask the chief if he's done any um, background on that? I think we talked about that um, previously so I just wonder if you've had a chance to uh, do anything with that um through chair to madam mayor um, we have looked at it just, um, briefly because we've, um, the, each municipality act has their own training group. So we have been, um, I've had a couple of meetings where we've kind of bounced that idea off, but it's more of, um, the way the other budgets go, like Wellesley, I think has already finalized their budget and things like that. So it's be more of an impact into next year. Um, we have built um, into our um, staffing, like I guess the scope of work for the person is to try and look at that and team up with our municipalities to try and create a position like that. So it is something we have looked at, but it's just a little difficult, like when everyone else has already got budgets passed or have people in part-time positions doing that job already, so... So would you see that being done with the current half-time position then um, for next year's budget to, to look at um, making it full-time and coordinating with the other municipalities for next year's budget? I, I'm not quite um, seeing how that fits. So um, we're looking at full-time for this year for our training officer to try and get our um, training within Woolwich up to where it needs to be because of the federal, the provincial government's mandate. Um, I've already started discussions, like I said, with some of our neighbor municipalities to see if we could, um, partnering with them where we could help is have them, have our training officer be kind of their training officer as well to make it a, a cost recovery type position. 
and are they open to that? Like, are you get what kind of feedback are you getting when you've talked to them? Um, we are getting some, like I said, we are getting some thoughts that that would be a good work for work for us. Um, but like I said, some of them already have part-time training officers like we do that are not, like I said, they, they're already set in what they're doing, but through the joint training um, agreement, the council passed two years ago, I guess now, um, we've been working with them to make that happen on a more of a regional standpoint. So like I said, some of our neighbors are, some of them aren't, but it's just a matter of just coming up with a model that we can do to make that happen. So we're working on it, but it's it's difficult when we don't have the position to start with. So any other questions, Councillor Grant? Through you, Mr. Chair, to the uh, the chief. So this would be we would be essentially needing the full time position in order to start investigating that uh, cost recovery. It's not a matter of us necessarily looking for a partner now to share that position. I'm just trying to clarify that aspect. Um, through Chair to Council Grant, that is correct. We need to have it kind of in place right now. Um, just the way the everyone's budgets are running, it's kind of difficult to cut into it, but there is, like I said, there is some traction in doing cost recovery with them and making it a more of a regional basis. Okay, thank you. Someone like to put a motion forward, either for delaying it a year or keeping it in the budget. Councillor Bryant. I'll make a motion that we defer for one year and gather more information in the interim about creating partnerships. Would someone like to second that? Councillor Schwint, any further discussion? Mayor Schantz. I'm a little bit conflicted knowing that um, it's a full halftime position right now and it, it's quite full and so then asking to put additional uh effort in uh, I, i'm still pondering so i'm just <laughs> i'm just putting that out there i'm a little conflicted right now Councilor Schwent. so a clarification maybe for mr brenneman or mayor shots has wellesley passed their budget in wilmot i I guess I read in our local paper that I thought there was some heated council meetings in the last week, but I don't know where they're at. Wellesley is passed. I'm not sure of Wilmot. Sorry. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, my 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 best understanding is while Wellesley certainly had a packed council chambers that council didn't um, ask their staff to um, adjust the budget uh, in any ways. That's my understanding, um, having talked with the uh, the CAO. Um, and um, yeah, Wilmot, um, uh, Wilmot is still, uh, their budget is uh, a work in progress. Uh, I think I could say that it's still a work in progress. Um, but just, I wanted to use this opportunity to say that um, um, I used the opportunity coming out of the, the last uh, final budget session that we are working session that we had uh, to say to both um, Chief Aldis and, um, and Deputy Chief Eveson that even though there wasn't a motion or specific direction from council um, with respect to exploring opportunities to get additional revenue from other municipalities to supplement our cost, that we should do that. Um, now, how that affects your decision tonight you know, is totally, again, it's up to you. Your, your, your final budget night, um, you have to decide where you want to go uh, with this. But um, certainly that was something as CAO that I said to uh, the chief and the deputy chief is that it seems like based on the working session, that uh, last working session that there seems to still be support, but we should nevertheless um, note that there was discussion about trying to see if there is potential sources of revenue by partnering with other municipalities. Um, so um, certainly that's something we were planning to explore anyways. Um, you know, uh, but uh, yes, the chief and deputy chief did say 
Um, that's something that they could better assess how, um, how many other municipalities we could support once we know, once we fully knew what the capacity of the position would, would be. So anyways, I just wanted to provide that information and context. Councillor Schwinn. So I guess I'm still in favor of Councillor Bryant's motion and deferring it for a year, but my understanding would be Mr. Brenneman that throughout the year, if agreements are made with other townships that staff come before council at any time and say, hey, we've got an agreement. Um, we're going to share this position. Council, you support us allocating this money and we could proceed somehow. Is that fair or that? So I, I, I think uh, I'll need some help from Mr. Petrick, but if there was going to be any um, budget impact to us, we'd have to serve notice that we're opening up the budget and, and be able to amend the budget. So um, to fairly answer your question, it would depend on whether we're still going to be on the hook for additional budgetary costs that wouldn't be budgeted for. Um, using your train of thought, that would be possible if what we came up with was it's not going to have any fiscal impact because our existing costs uh, for the part time are what they are, and the other sources of revenue cover off the difference. Um, but uh, at this point, you know that's an unknown factor. But if there was a budget impact, um, you know, and, and I'm sure I, speaking on uh, I can speak on behalf of Richard on this. It's never fun to open up the budget mid-year, um, but nevertheless, you know, uh, whatever council's direction is. I could follow up on that then. Would it be a workaround, I would say, to allocate $20,000 to the training position, provided that staff is able to make an agreement with other townships on a cost recovery program for a training officer position. So it's $20,000 in the budget, but you've got to find partners to add to that fund to pay the 75,000. So, so let, let's, let's work this out. And I'm looking at Richard. Um, I, I guess in some ways, um, I guess in some ways that's similar to what we've done with respect to the economic development and tourism intern, that there's money in the budget for the in contract position to continue, subject to us getting appropriate level of grant funding to offset it. So I'm just trying to figure out whether this would be comparable or not. Take a run at it, Mr. Cutter. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that's a great example, except we're dealing with somebody we already have currently right now. Right. And so if you we were going out for something that would be other than a part-time, you'd be taking on the risk of actually saying, well, now you have a full-time staff that either A, you're going to continue with them or B, you're in a potential severance. Now it would be a minor severance, uh, but that's kind of what you're looking at. But I think you were just talking about just adding $20,000 to the budget contingent on, yes, yes. but it would be adding 20000 to the budget, but also adding revenue to the to, to offset so it would almost be like an in and out is kind of what you were and that's what i was trying to get at just just adding instead of the seventy eight thousand, it's just twenty thousand. got it got it got it and uh yeah and then through you mr chairman i i think then you could be looking at um i think what uh councillor swint you were talking about is saying if we start finding agreements you know, and we can actually make this somewhat of a full-time position, we can kind of come back and say, now we actually have funding within the budget that we might be able to make this work. I think that's, if I correct, that's kind of where you were going. Got it. Yep. Hey, Shans. Just, just wondering, um, because I was going to suggest maybe a three-quarter time instead of a full-time person, which is a little more than 20,000, but do we need nice round numbers for staffing or does the 20,000 go for a few extra hours for the trainer to look into some of these things or or does, is it is that micromanaging? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, 
I couldn't say that I, I would say round numbers in, in my line of work, especially when dealing with staffing, always sounds like I'm playing with something. Um, but I, I, but I think if it's council's wish, given the stage of the game, it may be the easiest approach to do. Uh, I don't know what that's going to mean from an additional staffing time that, that would be available that would be available for the uh, fire department. I don't have that information. Hey, yeah, Brennan. Yeah, I actually like to direct that question from Mayor Schantz to the fire chief as to whether if council was to entertain Mayor Schantz's suggestion, I think the question would we would we have someone that either is already in the existing position or could fill a three quarter three quarter position, I guess that's what's being suggested. Uh, no, uh, no, I, I'm just I'm, I'm just trying to assess uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the mayor I'm trying to assess whether we could increase the hours of the existing staff person. Uh, let's start with that. Um, would that be a legitimate option in terms of increasing the existing hours of the current person in the position? Um, through chair to Madam Mayor and CEO Brenneman. Um, one of the difficulties that we're experiencing is our present part-time training officer has a full-time job and it's tough to, his shift work allows him a limited amount of time that he can do what he's doing. And right now it's pretty well at our, um, around his capacity as to what he can do at this moment. So to put more um, work on him to try and do something like that or even add more in is, is it possible? Maybe, but I mean, I don't know where the line will be where he just doesn't have any more time for us. So, cause he does training. He's also one of our firefighters. So it's kind of a, a balance between family work and the fire department. So. Councillor Cadeau, do you still have a question? Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, I don't know uh, if is somebody from HR on. They would probably be better one to direct this question to. But could we just implement like a, an FTE overage for two years and then reevaluate the position, see if some of those. Uh, partnerships um, could have been formed and how those are progressing and then maybe um, provide direction on whether to establish that as a permanent full-time position. Theo Brennan. Yeah, so nobody, yeah, unfortunately, nobody from HR is on, but I, I think still uh, more comfortable if myself or uh, Mr. Smith answers this question. I would look through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Cadeau and Council. Um, I would look at it this way. Uh, from my municipal experience, if council wanted to go that route, um, then you would look at a contract position for a set number of years. And I would also make sure that when you always look at contract positions, you do a suitable number of years uh, so that you can properly evaluate and also um, attract the right candidate. Um, because if you're looking to get somebody to leave a full-time job for a possible or for a contract that may or may not, uh, go somewhere someday. That's one of the things you factored into. But if I'm reading you correctly, Councillor, um, that's where I would go in my thinking uh, is you want proof of position. And from my experience, that's where even staff at times comes to you and says, uh, we're looking at a contract position. Councillor uh, Grant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the rest of Council. I'm just wondering um, if we were to fill this, our uh, um, we were to have this position be full time with this volunteer basically essentially leaving his job to take on this or would be looking at I'm just trying to judge if we're looking at three quarter time. Are we already in a position if we were to do full time looking for a new employee or would this individual that's already doing this leave their job to pursue this full time I'm just not I don't want to get into the details of their own personal life I'm just trying to gauge whether we're in the same boat if we're hiring a full position or if we're hiring someone that can do three fourths time. Um, through chair to Councillor Grant, I'm trying to figure out how I can answer this and not give out personal information. Um, but I think there is merit in your 
statement. So um, is the possibility that um, this our part-time person would pursue the full-time like like maybe it's, maybe. it's, it's tough maybe. i can't really maybe. maybe i can make this easier maybe. just say would we be putting out a job application essentially whether it's full-time or the three quarters because whether or not that individual then decided to pursue that that would be their own decision but i guess maybe that's an easier way to kind of address it is if we would be putting out an application for a full-time trainer so through um um to counselor grant um from what I understand from the process of hiring is we would be doing um, an internal um, posting and then possibly an external posting, depending on um, what type of commit, what type of how many people we got that applied internally. So we'd be doing it, we'd be putting out um, a request for staffing from internal and possibly also external. So. Any other questions? So there's still a motion on the floor that was moved and seconded um, to delay this position a year. Guess we can take a vote on that unless there's any amendments anyone want to add. Although- Can I call for a recorded vote just so you get to vote, Emma? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Do I direct that now to you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Since uh, Mayor Schantz called for a recorded vote, I'll uh, take the vote. Uh, the motion that I have, uh, and I just will read it again to make sure everyone is aware, is defer the fire uh, training officer position for one year to gather more information on partnerships. Um, and if that's the vote, I will call the question. Councillor Bryant? Yes, in favour. Councillor Cadeau? No, not in favour. Councillor Schwint? In favor. Uh, Councillor um, um, Grant? <laughs> Not in favor. Um, Mayor Schantz? Opposed. And Councillor Burgess? I'll be in favor. Um, that vote is tied, which means it does not uh, go forward since uh, a tied motion uh, is defeated. Um, Mr. Chair, you uh, you could call for another vote on another matter, or um, otherwise the budget uh, hasn't changed at this point. All right. Let's move on to the next item. So the next position um, would be the engineering project supervisor. Any comments on deferring that one a year? Mayor Shans. That one has, uh, I guess, unknown levy impact. Um, I think Mr. Petherick said probably very minimal levy impact on that, and it would mean delaying approximately $4 million in infrastructure work. Uh, we've been behind in our infrastructure for so long, and, and um, so I'm I'm not in favor of it for those two reasons. I'm not uh, sorry. I'm not in favor of removing it for those two reasons. Council Grant, do you chair to this council? I would be in agreement with Mayor Schantz. Um, I feel that when it comes to our infrastructure, we know it's only going to get worse. So it, delaying that position or deferring that position, I think, is just kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. Council Bryant. Um, just a point of clarification. I thought Jared was the one that mentioned it would be his department that would be um, impacted if we pulled his position by $4 million. Did I misunderstand that? That's what we're saying. Yeah. Okay. I thought she was saying that Deanna herself would be. No. Okay. No, just Okay. Just wanted to double check on that. Councilor Schwint. Oh, so very good arguments. So I guess one question I'd have is what effect would deferring the Peel Street Bridge have on the need for this position? Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Chairman Burgess, to uh, Councillor Schwint. 
So the position is not contingent on the Peel Street Bridge. Um, if council elects to um, proceed with the position and defer Peel Street, it, it doesn't change our work plan. I think there's enough work here for all those staff. Um, conversely, then if, if council elects to um, defer the position and proceed with Peel Street, um, we would just simply reduce the capital budget between four to $5 million. Um, so again, it's not contingent on the Peel Street Bridge. That is a project for a staff member to look after, but it has greater impacts and our program is set up for the additional staff members. So I think that's important for council to understand. If they were to defer the position, we are going to have to reduce the, the, the budget, uh, the capital budget from infrastructure services. But again, I don't want anybody to think it's con solely contingent on whether Peel happens this year or not. Any other questions for Director Pouvet? All right, do we have a mover for delaying the engineering project supervisor for one year? All right, Councillor Bryant, move that. Do we have a seconder? All right, that's seconded by Councillor Schwint. Any further discussion before we proceed? Go, go ahead. I wanna get this motion on the floor because we keep going down the path, but 8.5 isn't gonna change. So there's two sides of this. It's the program side, what are we gonna do and how much is gonna cost in the levy? And are we, what are we comfortable with? Um, so I think we spent a whole lot of time on not cutting things. Does that mean we are comfortable with 8.5? I would just say that the things that we've talked about haven't had significant impact. Um, if if it's the 8.5 that you're concerned with, I would um, refer that. I, I would ask staff if, if there's anything uh, that they could look at because I, we're not coming up with with much here. Um, but this particular, that's not really this particular motion. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cadeau. Thanks, Chair. Through you, more of a comment. Um, you know, I'm reflecting on something that CAO Brenneman said in some, one of the first sessions that we had on budget, and it's that Woolwich is at an inflection point. I think that we need to determine uh, what we feel comfortable with the level of services that we provide to the community members here. You know, are we content uh, asking staff to continue to do more with less? Or are we at that inflection point now where we're saying, you know what, we do support you. We recognize that you need more bodies to do the work that we're asking you to do. And we deliver. I think that we we really should be at that point now. And I think that if you look at the 8.5% increase, we are at the lowest tax rate amongst all of our comparators right now. That may not change all that much. Uh, in fact, I think that it puts us second lowest amongst all of our comparators. Now, I would state that we shouldn't be in a race to have the lowest tax rate because services will be impacted as a res result of that. So I am comfortable with the 8.5, um, you know, to your question, Councillor Schwint. Uh, I think that we've been going in circles around this budget because staff have done an excellent job putting forth a deliberate budget um, with not much for us to really cut around the edges. Um, so that's kind of my my pitch there. I don't know if it's going to resonate with anybody, but that's kind of where I stand with things. Councillor Bryant. I'm not comfortable with the 8.5. And the reason for that is I've had a number of emails from my constituents that are telling me They've been huge uh, increases in their mortgage rates. One particular lady renewed her mortgage last month. Her payments have gone up by $800 a month. They're seeing higher grocery costs. They're seeing higher costs everywhere. And they are very concerned with their ability to pay. They're living paycheck to paycheck, a lot of these people. So in support of my constituents, I would say I'm not comfortable with 8.5. Mayor Shantz. During COVID, uh, the previous council had 
a discussion similar to this in terms of taxes and people having uh, struggles to meet uh, their taxes. And we implemented a, a fund through Woolwich Community Services uh, that, that they managed uh, where people could go uh, to them if they were having trouble meeting their tax payments. I don't know, Mr. Petra, can you uh, remind me some of the details around that? Uh, the U.S. Chairman, so there, it's it, there's two things. So one was, you're right, it was actually uh, a fund that is can totally, totally and wholly contained within Woolwich Community Services. So that it was funding that they raised themselves and they managed themselves. We created, I believe, it was fifty thousand dollars for what we said was a Woolwich um, COVID relief fund, and we basically were uh, utilizing that for community groups. Is what we did. But what you're specifically were speaking to was something that went, uh, people went directly to Woolwich Community Services, and it was something that was fully in their hands. They actually raised their own funds and managed their own funds. Did we contribute to that, though? I thought we did. Yeah, I'm just drawing a blank. And if we did, I'm, I'm going to guess it was probably 10 That 000. was the original intent anyway. Um, where it landed may have been somewhere different. I'm not sure. Sorry, my recollection is off. Commission. Yeah, I concur with Councillor Cadol that we're not in a race to the bottom on the tax rates. We're not going to be the cheapest ever, but we got to make sure we're hopefully the most efficient with spending our dollars providing the most bang for the buck. And that inflection point, I wonder when we hit it, because part of the process, Mr. Petherick sent the full time equivalents for the last five years. We are up 25% in full-time positions over the last five years. So to say that we're not growing, I don't think it's fair. At the same time, I'm not saying they're not all needed either. In the past, it's how do we balance and grow responsibly? And you're right, it's a hard budget process to go through. And unfortunately, the next two, three, four budgets will not be any easier. Councilor Cadeau. To that point, I wonder if we have some data on the population growth over the last five years to see if maybe it would correspond to the rise in the FTEs that we're seeing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, not on me. Um, but we do have that information. We get that to council. We do have that information for sure, and we can send that to council. Not wanting to put you on the spot, but off the top of your head, could you? No? Okay, don't worry about it. Say hello, Brennan. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add this contribution. You know, certainly I think we could get those um, stats, uh, but I think I would also use the opportunity to remind council, and this is a, a good budget year to, to reflect on this, is sometimes it's we've added positions because of changes that the provincial government is making. Um, for example, you know, a, a big reason and rationale and the why provided by uh, Director Freeze on the senior planner position had a lot to do uh, with Bill 23 and Bill 109. Um, even with the fire position, the concern about mandatory certification. And, you know, if, you know, if we were to go back and do an analysis, um, there would be examples of that throughout history. For example, I know that the very first year, um, the very first year that I was here, we had to add a position because of Walker, uh, the Walkerton legislation. We needed to uh, put in place an overall responsible operator. It wasn't a question of if. We had to add a position because we had to protect the water system because the province said so. And so we can look at growth, absolutely. But I think I would say council also needs to factor in at times justification is related to downloading of responsibilities. So if I look at uh, the census from 2016, it shows, excuse me, I'm having trouble with my voice tonight, shows a population of 25,006. Um, now, this is a different uh, spot, but there's, um, uh, on the village, oh, sorry. Um, 28, I, yeah. 
where was I looking here on city populations website, it shows 28,657. That's a 14% increase from 2016, so over six years. <laughs> All right. Any other further discussion on that? So I think the vote now, as it's been moved to delay the position one year of the engineering project supervisor, all those in favor? And all those opposed? All right, that's carried or defeated. And uh, all right, so the last staff position um, would be the senior planner. The staff have any discussion on, sorry, on council have any discussion on that? Council Schwent? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I've got two concerns here. Number one, it sure appears that housing is going down, not up. And I expect that trajectory to continue for the next year, two years, something like that. So I do wonder if we've seen the crest of our building boom in Woolwich for on the short term anyway, and perhaps there's going to be less demand going forward on that side of things. Um, coupled with, we don't know for sure what Bill 23 is going to mean to us. So... I guess I could support a deferral on this one until we a learn more about Bill 23 and its effects and what we really need. Um, yeah, I think we got to find some place to cut. Any other questions? Also, Brian. Just a comment. I agree with what Eric has said. I've spoken to someone in the development industry and they've told me the same. Um, they've been in contact with one of the major home builders and they have already pulled two of their projects that were predicted to go ahead this year. They're not doing them. Mayor Shantz. This is probably a question that can't really be answered. And I probably look to Mr. Brenneman on this, but I mean, <laughs> As Councillor Schwint said, we don't know what Bill 23 is going to, uh, how that's going to play out. But I, I wonder, Mr. Brenneman, if if you would care to comment on the, the political uh, situation or the, the uh, expectation of growth, I guess, uh, for the region and for the township uh, coming from the province and the guidelines there. Yeah, so um, while Deanne isn't with us tonight, uh, I did ask Jeremy to attend. So I'm, I'm going to ask him to answer part of that. Um, but my contribution, um, you know, my contr contribution would be, you know, back when Deanne did present, um, I think it was the second time, um, the why and, and, the, uh, and addressing questions council had about the impact of not having the position. It was also with respect to projects that we need to complete related to the official plan, the zoning bylaw update and things of that nature. So uh, I think I'm going to leave it to Jeremy to con uh, comment on um, how they built the budget based on what they're seeing. And I appreciate what both uh, Councillor Schwint and Councillor Bryan are seeing. Certainly there have been comments from the building industry. However, that doesn't mean that our planners won't necessarily be busy as they try to set up for you know, the province's building of 1.5 million homes, and um, you know, um, ultimately, you know, these plans get approved with the future in mind as well in terms of future plans and subdivisions. So that's what we have to remember in terms of the chain of events as well. Uh, but Mr. Vink, could you perhaps uh, add to um, add to this discussion, please? Yes, uh, you, Mr. Chair, to Council. So. Uh... Deanne, uh, Director Freeze did give you some information previously. When we first presented the budget to senior staff, we actually, as you know, uh, we came with two people to try address some of the staffing issues in the planning department. 
that were already facing the department at the time. And we've scaled it back to one in the need, the biggest need being the senior planner. We saw that before Bill 23 came in at us. We weren't even aware of Bill 23 coming at us. We're preparing the budget. So Bill 109 was the big challenge in front of us, knowing that we now had these shorter timeframes to deal with, with, uh, with planning applications before we had to start refunding money. Realizing that we are heavy on various different applications going on, we just don't have the staffing resources to stay on top of it. So we're assuming that once these refunds kick in, we are not um, potentially going to be able to comply with those timelines and going to be doing the refunds if we don't have additional staff is one of the implications that way. So we had estimated just under $20,000 might be refunded potentially uh, this year if we don't have that staffing to help keep on top of the applications. And part of that's just going to mean we're going to, if we don't have the staffing resources, we're going to have to slow down various applications or various things that are coming at us, whether it's development applications from the public, just wanting to see things move forward, but also a number of our projects. So we do have the official plan uh, underway, active transportation, uh, the parks master plan that we're assisting with, and the zoning bylaw review that's getting completed. So each of those projects would just design, would have to slow down substantially without the staffing resources to keep them moving in a good timeline. Um, it doesn't help anyone, it just delays because there, we know there are various uh, people in the public actually looking forward to see some of these move forward in a timely manner, um, including the official plan review and zoning bylaw, right? So it's just going to hurt the, the public in general if we slow them down. It also means we're going to slow down any of the special projects we might have been tackling this, this year, including affordable housing, uh, some of the climate change um, initiatives, some urban design work that had to be considered based on changes from the province also. So all these things would have to slow down a bit. Just in terms of the, the changes in the economy and what's happening out there, it's true. We knew know the builders are slowing down, but as uh, the CIO has noticed it doesn't usually necessarily slow down in planning to say it stops. It means that just, uh, we may see a bit of a slowdown, uh, but developers are always moving forward to get their plans approved to get them ready for the day the market looks better or when they're ready to go. So they don't stop because it takes them years to go through these planning approvals and they're sitting on lands that cost them money. So they don't get money from the banks until their draft approved. So they can't do much. They want to get their draft approval in place so they're development ready as soon as possible, which means they're still coming at us with plans of subdivision, whether you anticipated or not, or we want it or not, they're probably gonna be coming at us with plans of subdivision still and working on those and seeking input on various reports and applications. Bill 23 just complicates things for us. Um, if we delay, the reality is we know, we, well, from what I understand, Bill 23 will kick in sometime this year. Those changes means we got to change our processes. If we don't have the staff to keep up with those changes or, under, or work through those changes, it's just going to slow us down further. So it's not going to help us to wait. Uh, it's just going to put us further behind. So this is just adding and just increasing the levels of issues behind us. Um, so to bring it back to the bit of reality on the on the council just talking about population. Um, just realize the planning department hasn't increased its full-time staff in 35 years. So we've probably doubled the township's population in that time period without increasing a single planner. So, and we're becoming more urbanized. So we're getting more urban issues with more planning issues on top of that. So we're not just dealing with the rural issues, we're talking urban issues with shadows and uh, compatibility and things like that. So there's a lot more complexity that we now have to take on and deal with. We need staffing to keep up with that. So. Uh, it's not as it, it's a challenge for us, and that's why we're saying that you know this is the need for the township at this point uh, to help us keep going forward and providing that best customer service that we're trying to achieve still. Thank you, Mr. Vink. Any other questions or comments from this council? All right. Would someone like to make a motion to delay the uh, senior planner, Councillor Bryant, to lay it for one year? Seconded by Councillor Schwint. Any further discussion? Mayor Schantz? I was leaning towards supporting it just um, until 
Jeremy said that uh, there's been no increase in 35 years and that sort of struck home to me because we have been growing and it is getting more complex. Um, so I don't think I can support the motion um, because of that. Councillor Schwinn. But to tell you one next step that I would challenge a little bit in terms of maybe there's no planners in the 35 years, but there is more staff in the department. We've got a GIS person. Um, there's a min help. I don't know how that's portioned and utilized, but there's a director. So I guess I do believe there's re more resources there. Is there enough? There's never enough. I'll fully admit that. But with timing where it is, it's hard to justify this one in my mind. Mr. Vink, did you want to add anything? Just through Mr. Chair to Councilor Schwint, just to, there was a comment there about knowing staffing. Yes, we did add a GIS person, true, um, but their position has nothing to do with planning, so to speak. They don't do planning. They assist with GIS work and do the GIS mapping, which assists all departments. Um, that used to be done on the planner's desk, correct? Um, used to be my job, part on the side. Not really a full part of the position originally. Um, in terms of amend help, we've had a, the same amend help uh, one person in 35 years. That same position has always been there. So we haven't increased the admin help either. So the only change has been a part-time contract person for three days in the last few years. So there has been no substantial change in the planning, the number of planning staff from admin and planners in the township, including a director. So we've always had a director for the department at the same time. And they're split between helping other sections of the department. So just for clarification. Councilor Grant. I think I would ask for a recorded vote on this just so we have the full council kind of being able to vote on this position. All right, any last comments before we vote? All right, I'll turn that over to Director Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, Councilor Grant has requested a record, recorded vote uh, on a motion to defer the senior, pla senior planner position for one year. I'll do the same thing I did before, calling all council uh, to vote in a random order. Councilor Burgess. <laughs> I will be opposed to this one. Councillor Schwint. Councillor Grant. Opposed. Councillor uh, Mayor Schantz. Opposed. Um, Councillor Cadeau. Opposed. Councillor Bryant. In favor. That motion fails with four votes against and two votes in favor. Um, with that, the senior planner position is as it was proposed in the budget, unless there is any further discussion on that one. Thank you, Clerk Smith. All right, moving on to the last one that Councillor Bryant brought up and the one of contention the last little bit, the Peel Street Bridge. Does Council wanna, someone wanna jump in on that one? Motion to remove. I mean, and, uh, that, uh, nothing has really changed uh, in my mind from my previous discussions. Um, around this, um, recognizing um, that this is a tough decision um, and one that shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, so I appreciate Councillor Bryant in uh, kind of leading with, with this item as even a potential uh, to defer by a year. I know that that's a, um, a pretty big concession for you to even say that. So it's recognized and, and appreciated. Uh, I think that we owe it to at least examine this throughout the budget deliberation process, regardless of how this council decides that the final um, vote is uh, is irrelevant. I think that we we really needed to go through this so that we could own this decision just as much as the previous council. Um, so with that, I mean, I will motion to defer by one year, um, and I'll just leave that on the table.
All right. Oh, go ahead, Councilor Grant. Uh, through you to the rest of Council. Uh, Point of order, shouldn't it be a seconder before we have discussion? Oh, yeah. All right. Have we even had an original mover yet of the motion? All right. Moved it. Who wants to second it? Councilor Ryan, we second it. Go ahead, Councilor okay. Grant. <laughs> Um, just two two points on this. I like I know this has been a point of contention not just for us but also for previous councils. Um, I do worry what delaying will bring for the cost in a future year. Um, I understand that we're all grappling with kind of being new to this process when the previous council has been mired in it for several years. Um, so that is where my concern lies in delaying it for a year. But I would also request that this vote be a recorded vote as well. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from council? Councilor Schwint? I think when there's contentious issues, there's two reasons for it. One is not enough information, or two is there's no clear path forward. And I believe this issue is both of them. Um, as a new council, I'd like to have more information on the options. Um, the pedestrian bridge for that much money is not palatable to me, so I want to close it immediately. But if the economics come back and a small car type bridge, horse and buggy bridge isn't much more money, that opens my eyes and makes me pay attention. So more information is good and big decisions we need to spend time on. So it's not wasted time today. Councillor Ryan. Thank you. Um, I do fully support keeping that bridge, but I will defer for a year based on the fact, <clears throat> pardon me, people want more information. I think that needs to be brought forward so everybody can make an informed decision. And a year isn't going to make or break whether we get this bridge completed. So I really feel we do need to give council the opportunity to get the information they need to make an informed decision. All right, with that, uh, a mover to defer the bridge for one year. We got that, sorry, going through these so many times. I'll turn that over to Director Smith for the recorded vote. Oh, oh see, I had it on, there we go. Okay, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, I am ready to go. Um, Councillor Grant has requested a, record, a recorded vote on a motion to remove the Peel Street Bridge from the budget. Sorry? Defer for one year. Defer for one year. My apologies. Um, to defer the Peel Street Bridge from the budget for one year. Um, I will call. Uh, I can add uh, that if the. Um, uh, I have Councillor Cadeau moving the motion if the mover is okay with that mm -hmm. and provide more uh, more information for Council. Yeah. Perhaps more information around um, next steps. I know that uh, some information has been provided to us around some of the options, um, maybe exploring what some of those options could look like at this stage um, could be valuable. Is everyone clear on the motion? Okay, I'm going to do the same thing I've done before. I'm uh, asking for um, anyone in, in support or opposed to the motion, and I will call uh, the vote in a random order. Mayor Schantz. Uh, I support it. Councillor Grant. Opposed. Councillor Cadeau. Support. Councillor Burgess. Support. Councillor Bryant. Support. Councillor Schwint. Support. That motion is carried with five votes in favor and one vote against. Councillor Bryant. Thank you. Through you to Mr. Patrick, I have one question. Do you have any recommendations of what could be pulled from the budget? I know I've asked you this before and you threw it back to council. So we're running out of ideas. 
uh, so through you, Mr. Chairman, I think I'm going to be consistent in what I said to council on our last night of uh, scheduled budget meetings. My concern still lies with operating. Like, I think we have been leaned down, you know, I use the word lean down, and I think that's my polite way of saying we've really been leaned down significantly over the years. And I'm really concerned that we need to have the operating dollars in, in place to be able to have that impact, you know, kind of like the now. So my options would always be deferring some infrastructure stuff, potential the infrastructure levy, you know, it's a 1.5%. You know, there are some some additional infrastructure options. It's not a pleasant thing. And I know this council is not in favor of that, but that that's kind of more, as I said before, I my goal is really to keep that operating in intact. So I I kind of showed you my lean. I think that addresses all of Councillor Brian's concerns. I'll Mayor Johns. Thanks. Um Mr. Petherick, can you remind me, were there any positions or, well, we don't have many positions here, um, where we could uh, adjust the start date and, and find some funds that I know is going to put us behind the eight ball next year, but um, just for council's consideration. Yeah, uh, through Mr. Chairman. So, I mean, that that is one of the things that I did look at was if, if council decided that they wanted to to you know, both delay the start of the fire training officer as well as the uh, senior planner. I think you'd be looking at a total of about 74, almost 75,000 in savings if you were to delay it. And I was thinking about a July 1st start date. So kind of like halfway through the year. CEO Brenneman. Yeah, just, you know, I guess to assist with, with some of the discussion that even Councillor Brian had raised, you know, I think the reality is, even if Council reflects on, on what you've looked at, you've looked at, at the same, same things in fairness at times during this budget process that other Councils have looked at. For example, um, you know, one of the decisions that was made last year was to delay the start date for the for the new roads positions that helped with the tax rate for last year but that just delayed the full impact for one year so it's been very interesting sitting back as staff to see this new council reflect on the fact that okay we can do this but what are we just putting off for the future if, if we fundamentally support and the same thing you've done the same thing when you've tried to factor in well, if we defer this infrastructure project, it's not a question of if, it's only a matter of when it's going to have to be done. So do we want to see it done now or not? So that's what my contribution would be is, while I appreciate, um, you know, all councils are looking to see what they can do, um, even in some way, shape or form. Uh, so there's always solutions. But what you've also determined in the past through your own deliberations is as I just said, what other councils uh, in, in terms of them making decisions have just allowed the thing to change for that year in terms of the tax rate being lowered, but it just had an impact the following year or the year after that. Any chance? Mr. Petherick, can you remind me again uh, what that impact was uh, on this budget? Do you, Mr. Chairman, to clarify, are you referring to the four road staff? Yep. Uh, just give me one second because I do have that information. Uh, we are looking at from a salary. This was just the salary perspective. Uh, it was about $180,000 was the impact to, to 2023. That wasn't including the fact that we would have increased equipment costs because we would be having more of our staff actually in doing work so they need equipment to do that but you know from that perspective I still say that we were pretty fortunate that in 2022 we were funding that from our new assessment growth and we're going to be doing the same in 2023 so that impact is actually being picked up by our new assessment growth it's not affecting the 8.58 at least that's not the way I'm framing it how's that <laughs> 
because if it did, then that assessment growth would go somewhere else. <laughs> Essentially, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> Councillor Bryant. Thank you. Through you to Mr. Pathwick. Can you remind me what that 0.8 was for again that we added at the end? Uh, that was for us that we, uh, so there was two $3,000 grants that we took out of the uh, corporate services budget. And then we added, um, I have to say, because I want to make sure I got the numbers right. I think it was four and uh, just give me one second here. And actually it's in the budget report, which is funny enough to say, and maybe I'll just reference that back. Uh, it was uh, 4,000 for the uh, contribution to the BIA CIP, uh, and that was for the accessibility uh, grant through the MIR BIA, uh, BIA uh, as well as 13,000 again to the MIR BIA for uh, their greening project. So it's a total of 17,000 that we added, uh, and then we cut 6,000 from the corporate services grant. Go ahead, Councillor Schwinn. Um, when the operating we've spent a lot of time on, can we go back to the reserve funds, Mr. Petherick? If you looked at our reserve funds, which ones are you most worried about and to what degree? To you, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would say uh, to Councillor Schwinn, I am probably the most concerned about our uh, operating contingency because we are pulling again, once again, from that pretty significantly because we do have some one-time uh, costs that are coming up. Uh, we are continuing on with our uh, termite program, which is coming from that, uh, that reserve, as well as uh, funding for our asset management plan, but that will be a one-year impact. Um, the other one, uh, definitely for me, would be our water and wastewater uh, reserve funds. You know, I think as council is aware, we're talking about taking on debt uh, in this current uh, capital budget because we don't have enough capacity in our reserve fund to be able to accommodate that expenditure. Uh, but I think water is probably not going to be that far behind, you know, that we're going to be potentially pushed to that uh, to that point as well. You remind me what the balance is on the operating contingency. And one more would be my would be equipment. That would be my other one. Yeah, equipment. And I sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, to you, Councillor Schwind, it was it was something I mentioned within our uh, uh, I guess as we were going through I guess the preamble in the first night when I was saying I am concerned that with the significant cro uh, cost escalations in our heavy equipment and even our pickup trucks. Uh, that it is something that we're not putting away enough money right now. And we're just going to have to be kind of balancing about how we're going to be managing that reserve fund as we go through the years. So what I'm projecting, and this was in the, uh, uh, I guess, one of the, the appendices for council. If I can just get to the right one. Uh, Projecting balances within the operating contingency reserve at the end of 2023 with uh, the ins and outs, probably about 168,000 in that reserve. Uh, from a water perspective, uh, looking at about 880,000 and uh, only about 43,000 in the wastewater reserve fund. And the equipment, uh, I think we're going to be able to manage in 2023, uh, will be just shy of 700,000 in that reserve fund. I mean, the good news, at least from the equipment, as well as the water and wastewater, is there is a funding source for it. The operating contingency, it, it relies on us having a surplus to be able to, or unexpected revenues to be able to put into that, where the other three at least have a funding source that can kind of replenish that as we go through. Any last questions? We Go ahead, Councillor Grant. I believe we also have to yet address the EID um funding the six thousand and the pride and all that stuff thank you councillor grant all right so do we want to discuss that now currently the six thousand for the 2023 budget for edi and the three thousand for hope multicultural festival any comments from council I'd I'd make a motion to approve. Six plus three. Six plus three. So it's not part of it. 
Seconded by Councillor Grant. Go ahead, further discussion, Councillor Kudo. Uh, Thank you, uh, Chair. Through you uh, to Director Smith, um, made this comment earlier. I'm just wondering if we can um, rehash it now. Uh, if we're going to proceed with something like this, can we have a budget line that speaks to EDI as a more broad framework that Pride would fall within, as well as this would fall within, and potentially other initiatives that would uh, kind of fit the bill? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, I, I think we can do that. I actually um, just wanted clarity on uh, on the, uh, I believe it was a motion moved by Councillor Schwint. Um, the, the Hope Multicultural Festival requested an event grant of $3,000. Um, and I, I kind of put that in, in several recommendations in my uh, report that you considered early, earlier tonight. So um, there was a proposal for $6,000 to be added to the budget. And I think we can do um, exactly what Council Cadeau is suggesting, uh, a separate line in the budget and the grants budget for equity, diversity, and inclusion events and activities. Of that money, $3,000 for the Hope Multicultural Festival can be approved if that's Council's wish tonight. I think the only remaining question was, um, did you want the Pride um, grant that you had previously approved to come out of that 6,000 or is that a separate line? So I'm just looking for clarity on that one from Council. Council Grant? I would see that be a separate line. It seems to be a one-off event for, for this year and then maybe subsequent years we can look at having it come from that fund. Mayor Shans. I was gonna suggest we we put it all together in, in one line, but um, I wanted to ask Mr. Petherick to remind us of, um, I, I, I think we have a line for grants, uh, like council grants, or did we take that out? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not sure exactly what you're referring to from a council grants, but so this is part of the grants budget, which is in corporate services, but there isn't something that's specific to council. We have $1,500 that is like, I would say travel and assistance type of grant, but okay. that's all that's, that's, that's left. Everything else, ev yeah, okay. everything else is, is been very much accounted for kind of a, like that line by line perspective. Okay, thanks. Councillor Schwint. Sorry, my intent on that motion was, um, we have $6,000 already, adding another $3,000 to that budget. So that would cover the Hope Creek event, the Pride event, and leave some funds for whatever projects come up during the year, but keep it in one line because there's too many lines in our budget. I'll maintain seconding it, yeah. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll just ask for Director Smith just to clarify that motion before we vote on it. So I, I think if I'm hearing council correctly, uh, Councillor Schwint uh, moved a motion that Councillor Grant seconded. Um, essentially the entire uh, recommendation that I had put forward in my report. And uh, just with the clarification that the pride grant uh, that council already provided will come out of that $3,000. So that's not an addition, that's um, within that $3,000. Did I hear that wrong? Oh, within the 6,000, I'm sorry. I said it wrong. The remaining. The remaining, yeah. Um, so there, okay, so I, I heard it wrong. $9,000 total. $9,000 total in the- Allocating three plus. Sorry, sorry. Three plus three thousand for Oak Creek plus the pride one, which I don't know the exact number, 1,200? About seventeen hundred dollars, seventeen seventy-five. So leaving a balance of about forty-two fifty to be allocated during the year. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Chair. I'll just make sure that uh, Mr. Patrick um, is clear on that, because I might need his help on this one. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, I'm in your budget right now. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so so essentially, it's adding the uh, three thousand for the Hope Multicultural Festival, uh, and kind of contained within that. So it's it's nine uh, with the additional six, and from that six, 
um, this 1,775 for the Pride event will be coming out of that six. And that would leave $4,225 for, for council's discretion throughout the year. Okay. Any further discussion on those? All right, all those in favor? And that's unanimous, so that's carried. Sorry, Chairman Burgess. Go ahead, Director Poupe. I apologize for jumping on late. I think I just needed from Council's direction to defer the Peel Street Bridge. I understand that direction, but I think there's some other pieces that need to be discussed uh, just so we got uh, crystal clear direction moving forward. Um, the intent then from the motion was to defer the construction of the pedestrian bridge to a future year, but then I did hear other council members speak to additional information um, on, on the Peel Street Bridge. The way it's set up now, the EA has identified the pedestrian conversion, and that is what has been designed and ready for tender, which we will defer until 2024. If there was any changes uh, or any additional information, I guess, it would be helpful for staff to understand what that means because um, in, it, there would be no money in the budget for Peel Street. So if it was council's uh, will to explore uh, that decision, then that would require funding in this year's budget to be able to explore uh, alternates. If it is not council's decision to do that and simply defer um, the current project, then, then, then it's crystal clear to staff and, and we simply just move the money to 2024. So I think I just wanted clarity from council on, on what the direction truly is for the Peel Street Bridge. Council like to comment on that? Council Cudo? Thanks through you uh, to Director Pepe. Um, I know that a lot of the information that has been provided is relatively recent and there is a lot of information to wade through. So perhaps um, to provide clarification, uh, motion to defer would probably be sufficient to allow additional time for council to kind of wade through some of this material and potentially bring forward um, questions um, that may feel as if uh, have gone unanswered uh, throughout this deliberation process. Any other comments? So just, Go ahead, Mayor Shantz. Just a question to uh, to Mr. Poupe. Are you concerned if we would give direction to open up the EA that there's no funds there? Is that, is that what you're referring to, just to be clear? Yeah, through, through you, Chairman Burgess, to Mayor Shantz, that's exactly right. If, if council's looking for information throughout the year and then decides to open up the EA, they would have to allocate money for doing that and then we've lost time and i think that's the concern too um that at, at this stage we're simply deferring the pedestrian only conversion and that is we are very comfortable with that and what that means but i just i just wanted to be crystal clear with council that if there was any changes to the ea that does require a process and that would require time and that would require consultant fees and that would require uh, uh money being allocated in 2023's budget or at a future date i guess that is council's prerogative they could certainly um, uh, um, assigned dollars throughout the year, but uh, just while we're talking budget now, obviously it makes more sense to, to have that discussion maybe. Mayor Shantz? Yeah, I just think that this council needs time to process the information that's there. And um, I, I'm not gonna presuppose where that's going to lead because I really don't know. Um, so, but I, I do know that throughout the year, we have different projects that some have overruns and some have uh, have surplus left over. So I, I, I think that uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But I, I do think that this council needs time to, uh, to process those options. Um, so, yeah. Council Bryant. Through you to Mr. Poupe. Um, just a question. If, for example, the council wanted to open that bridge to horse and buggies, would that require a whole new EA or could they just work on the EA that has been done and look at different options? And through Chairman Burgess to uh, Council Bryant. So the EA is complete. There is no more EA that is ongoing. So that decision was made. So 
any changes to allow horse and buggy would have to permit vehicular traffic as well. There's no way to preclude motorized vehicles by allowing horse and buggy. So if that was council's wish, we would have to open the EA and explore uh, other replacement options that would permit vehicles, including uh, horse and buggy traffic. Thank you. Any other comments from council? Does that help? Director Poupe, I think right now we're just looking to digest the information and learn more. Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Council, is there anything else we want to discuss before we look at moving the main uh, recommendation with the new amendments? No, all good. <laughs> All right, if there's nothing else we want to discuss, I'm going to ask Director Smith if he is all right just summarizing any amendments we made to this recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think my camera is just taking a sec. There we go. Um, so the recommendation in front of you is uh, considering the Director of Finances and Treasurer's Report FO5 2023 respecting the 2023 budget. Um, there's, a, I, I guess each, each item in that is numbered. So the first item is to approve the 2023 operating capital budgets as amended, uh, including uh, the amendments that you've made tonight. Um, the amendments that I saw were to defer the Peel Street Bridge, and remove the EV charging station um, from the budget with staff to come back to council with a report uh, with more information on community, um, um, community partners payback cost and cost benefit analysis. If so I can just interrupt for one sec, Director uh, Patrick oh. wants to jump in on that. Yeah, see, you, Mr. Chairman, uh, it wasn't to remove the EV project. It was just to report back before staff move forward with it. Thank you, yeah, Mr. So, so don't, yeah, don't do any expenditures until they report back to council. Sorry, I, I see that now. I said the wrong thing. I had the right thing written down. Um, I will ask you, though, Mr. Patrick, uh, do you maybe, and maybe it's not fair, but do you have any um, update on that net levy? Uh, did that change at all? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, yes. Okay. With the with the motion from your uh, report. Sorry, to Clerk Smith's report, not to Mr. Chairman's report. <laughs> <laughs> Audience may not know where my eyes are looking. Uh, so that new uh, net levy number is fourteen million three hundred ninety-two thousand four hundred forty-three. And that would be an 8.64. Um, Mr. Chair, I can keep going if you want. Uh, the second item was to approve the 2023 water budget with a net expenditure that remains unchanged from the report. Uh, the third item was to approve the 2023 water uh, wastewater budget with a net expenditure that did not change from the report. Uh, the fourth uh, item there was to approve the water and wastewater fees and charges bylaws. Um, as attached uh, to the report. And the fifth item was to approve the Township Awards 2023 Corporate Business Plan as presented. Um, there is not a mover and seconder on the floor, uh, Mr. Chair, but I, I think that summarizes the discussions. I'll just uh, get a, a nod from the treasurer. Yep. All right, thank you, Director Smith. I will look for a mover. Oh. All right. Sorry, I'd like to ask for a recorded vote on this one, please. All right, thank you, Councillor Bryant. Can I have a mover? Councillor Cado and seconded by Councillor Grant. Any last further discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Schwint. Um, a question before I cast my vote. We're approving this committee to hold this week, ratifying it next week. So vote this week can definitely change next week and we're... At this point, I'm struggling to support the budget with these extra positions that were contentious tonight. Um, now you stand the way there, I realize that maybe I should accept it, but right now I'm still struggling that we haven't 
made the cuts that I think many residents are going to have to make this year. So for that reason, tonight I, I can't support it yet. Mayor Shantz? Just to, to add to the discussion, um, about one and a half percent is a carryover from last year's decisions, just to, to put that spin on it as well. Councilor Bryant? Uh, just a comment. As Erica said, I can't support that number based on my residents' information that they've been sending me. Any other discussion before I move it over to Director Smith? All right, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Bryant, um, I believe is Bryant request a recorded vote on uh, the budget motion in front of you as clarified or as uh, amended by council this evening. Uh, Mr. Pethrick has provided the updated net levy and the updated um, tax increase. If everyone's clear on the motion, I will call uh, for a recorded vote uh, with councillors in a random order. Uh, councillor Schwind. Opposed. Councillor Bryant. Opposed. Councillor Burgess. In favor. Councillor Cadeau. Support. Councillor Grant. Support. Mayor Shantz. In favor. That motion is carried with four votes in favor and two votes opposed. Thank you, Director Smith. All right. Do we have, moving on to the next section of business here, other business, do we have any discussion on council reports or updates? Mayor Johns? Prior to the meeting, um, Councillor Schwint was asking about a, a meeting that um, CAO Brenneman and I had with uh, MPP Mike Harris uh, regarding uh, the the current bills and and costs associated with it, and I can tell you that we had a very uh, good and productive meeting. We provided uh, a spreadsheet on uh, what our capital costs are and some of our shortfalls, and uh, he was very receptive to working with us and uh, working with. The, the provincial government to, to try to find ways to uh, mitigate those. Mr. Brenneman, did you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. I would just add um, that um, Mr. Petrick was also at the meeting and, and it's thanks to him for his wonderful spreadsheet uh, that he put together that was a, for us to have a fruitful discussion around uh, the gap that we have in terms of growth related projects um, with some of the decisions uh, that the province um, has made. Uh, and to that end, um, there was a commitment to um, look for you know, appropriate sources of infrastructure funding um, through the provincial level uh, to see where they could support. And we committed, um, I think by the beginning of April, um, to be able to provide a business case uh, and rationale for why um, we chose um, the largest uh, of our particular uh, growth related projects. So when I'm talking about that, um, we obviously identified things such as the future EA connector road. Um, uh, we also identified the Breslau wet well, um, going from memory here, um, Barnswell, uh, Greenhouse Road. Um, so there was about four or five projects that we identified because of the size that we would need the most help for. Uh, because the potential are having to look at debt uh, for the future as well. So, um, you know, certainly we know that there has been, um, you know, lots of comments uh, and concerns regarding um, where the province is going with some things, but uh, there seemed to be a, a, a real commitment um, to, you know, as other cabinet ministers or even the uh, other cabinet minister, I should say, have indicated is uh, trying to make municipalities uh, I guess, as whole as possible, recognizing that we will need support for some of our growth-related projects. So I'd just like to express my appreciation to Mayor Shots and staff for meeting with MPP Harris and preparing that report. Um, in our package tonight, we saw a multitude of motions from other townships 
saying they didn't like Bill 23 and 109. Whereas I think Woolwich's approach of sitting down with our elected officials, showing the real numbers and trying to work together for a solution, I think in the long term, if we continue that strategy, it's going to be a lot more effective and it's time well spent. Any other updates or reports? All right, um, on to outstanding activity list. Any discussion on that? Oh. Director Smith. Um, uh, yes, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. I, I just thought I would mention that uh, further to a request from council, uh, staff are gonna come forward next week with some updates on uh, why those activities are on the outstanding activity list um, to give an update to council. So uh, staff will be able to give uh, some additional information. And if, if there are any questions from council, please feel free to bring those questions about any of those items on the outstanding activity list to uh, the next meeting of council. Thank you. Any other discussion on that or anything else? All right, there are no notices of motion. And that brings us to the end of our meeting. Is there anyone willing to move and second the adjournment? <laughs> Moved by Councillor Cadell and seconded by Councillor Grant. All those in favor? And that's carried. In closing, Council would like to thank all who participated or tuned into the meeting tonight. Council, please stay connected on Zoom until the live stream has stopped. Good night, everyone.